Welcome back to another episode of Backlog Crew. Uh, my name is Ryder, and I will be hosting our episode today. Uh, we are collectively known as Press A to Talk, and I am here with Kurt, John, and Joseph. This is going to be part two of our Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus uh, video series. We will be covering roughly the second half of the game, uh, starting at the chapter Vicious Voodoo. This is right after Sunset Snake Eyes. Um, like I said, we will be playing through to the end of the game, so if you've been waiting or want to play through with us, second half today. So, trying to think of where really to start with this. We're pretty far into the game now. It's a very short game, but most of the mechanics are pretty much set in stone at this point. There's a few new things that are added in here. Um, but mechanically, there aren't really many changes at this point going forward. Uh, the biggest change that we're going to see at this point is just going to be something called a rail slide, um, which allows us to kind of glide along rails, um, usually downward, sometimes around in circles. Uh, so as far as, like I said, the mechanics, I don't think there's too much to discuss here at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of new enemies in this area. Really cool uh in my opinion, this is my favorite area in the game. We're actually in the jungles of Haiti, the swamps of Haiti, as far as the colors whatnot. I don't think this necessarily looks washed out, but a lot of it looks like baby food as far as the colors. <laughs> so I don't really love that part of it. But I loved every other part of this chapter. Um, like I said, there aren't a whole lot of new mechanics added. Uh, but the one thing that we did get, the rail slide, is actually something that kind of detracted from my enjoyment of this chapter in general. Uh, before we go in too deep into it, though, does anyone else have opinions just on this chapter as a whole? Like I said, the new mechanic introduced, new enemies, anything like that? I want to jump in because I feel the exact opposite that you do, Ryder, in that <laughs> I really liked the aesthetics of this level, but I hate pretty, I hated pretty much everything about it. Hate's a strong word. I disliked pretty much everything about it. Um, <laughs> and in large part, in due to the, to the mechanics, and not necessarily the rail slide, I thought that was kind of underwhelming because I kind of had in my mind like uh, Sonic Adventure style, super fast, swooping around. And it's kind of it was like you're sliding through molasses. Um, at least it worked. What got me was that there are more levels in this area than not that require you to do lengthy platforming sections where you're having to use your thief abilities to like balance in precarious situations. And I was on PS Now. Maybe there's a chance that it was just the delay caused from PS Now. But it was just extremely inconsistent, and I would just die constantly, even though I seemingly were, seemingly was timing the button presses the same way. Um, I don't want to ramble too long, but like the big example of this was in the, the Beast Within level, or whichever one that had the giant snake in it, where it was just like constantly, constantly like swinging and... and, and um, landing whatever that's called but i don't know maybe that's just me so so before i let the other guys talk uh, as someone who also used ps now i didn't really have much of an issue um i did use an ethernet cable not sure if you're using one or not i was on um, wi-fi that might have you know consisted of uh or helped consist of those issues uh words uh, I, I don't know i'm you sorry know. i was gonna say that might be it because um a little bit later, like when I was going through the area, that is the only time that my, the PS Now actually crashed because the internet connection was unstable. So maybe that's it, but either way, it left a bad taste in my mouth for this area, um, which is disappointing because I usually really enjoy uh, like the swamp levels in games. I just think it's a cool vibe. How about you, Joe? This was the first area where jumping on things did not work for me very much. I died. I think I got a game over the first time I sat down and started playing on like the first level in this area, which I think was the same area that Kurt was just talking about, where you're sliding on a lot of things and jumping on a lot of things. And I was missing like the majority of my jumps for some reason. Mm -hmm. I thought the aesthetic was fine. It just felt like a swamp area. Nothing really, it didn't really stand out to me much, I guess. I didn't hate it. I didn't like it that much. Joe, how do you feel about the uh, the double jump? That's something we didn't really talk about last time. It, it, I wish it was bigger, I guess. It just doesn't yeah, feel it feels, that important. 
it just feels like he kind of does a flip, but you don't gain any like mm-hmm. distance or altitude. Um, yeah. And so that was I think a lot of my problems were like missed timing with a double jump because I would jump like halfway to my thing and I was like, oh, I need a double jump. So then I would press the double jump button, and but I wouldn't make happens. it. So you yeah. kind of just have to like mash it back to back to get maximum jump. And I don't know, maybe that's just something yeah. I should have. It's like if you press it again to. at the peak of your jump, it goes a little bit higher. But anything after that is just like negligible. It seems mm-hmm. like. I think that it, it's most noticeable for like a horizontal jump versus a vertical jump. If you're going straight up, it's not really noticeable at all. But if you're jumping over a distance, it is yeah. a little bit more noticeable. But I don't I don't think it was really compared to I don't want to go back to this, but it's just like I kept on being reminded the game playing this with Spyro. Um, these last few worlds really felt like Spyro to me. And the jump in that, uh, the double jump is very noticeable. It feels, you know, helpful. <laughs> mm-hmm. But in this, there were a lot of points where I was hitting the double jump button and not really going anywhere. And it, I didn't really notice any trouble sticking like my landings or anything until a little bit later. Um, but I, I realized playing through the second half of the game that I like quadruple mash the circle button i don't know if anyone else does that i don't just hit circle i like whenever i see that, that might be part of it because i'm afraid that i'm not going to like snap to the ledge or whatever and so whenever i'm getting close to it i like spam it and so i, I pretty much always hit it yeah I, I had to start doing that um whenever it was missing some of my inputs i had to start double tapping circle and that did come up in this area quite frequently, and it, I would say it was a tad bit aggravating because at some points I would hit with the character the item I was trying to uh, to land on or, or to use a cane on, and it would require you to click circle. Well, I feel like if my character is hitting his face on the item, it, it should have noticed my input, but the second time usually got it if the first time didn't. And then um, just to add on to the conversation we are having a second ago, I would say that overall I did enjoy this area a lot better than uh, the previous area. Um, the only part that I would say I disliked was the Piranha Lake mini boss. So, and then <laughs> moving uh, forward probably a little too much, but the boss I didn't quite enjoy that much. But so so you actually can I talk about the boss? No, not yet. <laughs> we'll get I'm there. Ready. So ready. that actually yeah, brings yeah. me to our next point, which is going to be favorite level. Um, John, you've already kind of touched on this, so I'm going to go ahead and butt in. My favorite level, I think, actually was the piranha uh, flaming level. There's a level where you have to run over piranhas and eviscerate them, tear them to shreds, and it gives you fuel to then light torches. I I thought it was hilarious, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. I guess uh, I I think the minigames in general in this chapter were just my favorite. I think that's really where a lot of my enjoyment came from, because there's another mini game um, where a ghost is wanting to make fried chicken. And so you have to go and whack 50 chickens. And He's making gumbo. <laughs> He's see, making gumbo? Is that is, what it is? This, is? this is New Orleans, Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making gumbo. You're right. Yeah, so that the chicken one was my favorite, and then my least favorite was the Piranha Lake, just because... I lit up the very last flame at the same time the clock ran out and it showed me the animation for the flame, but then it told me try again. Yes or no. Yeah. 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 That's that's a quick way to ruin enjoyment for sure. I know we had similar issues with Metal Gear Solid when we were playing through that. Um, How about you, Joe? What do you think as far as a favorite chapter? I really like the front flame level. The mini game. I thought it was fun. I thought the boat or whatever controlled like in a, I don't know if it controlled well, but it controlled fun, I guess, because mm-hmm. it slides around so much. I kind of wish there was like a little bit more time or that the piranhas weren't as difficult to catch sometimes, but I guess it adds to the challenge. I beat it on like my second or third try. But I was having fun was- with it. Something fun about, you know, beating, you see like a school of piranha. Sometimes there might be like three or four in one area. And if you can cut the corner, you can crush all of them. And all of a sudden you have max fuel. And that that was just extremely satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. I agree. How about you, Kurt? What was your favorite? Okay. We're not doing that yet. But, okay, you can disagree. You can disagree. (laughs) I, I mean, the piranha level was fine. Just... 
it was like I don't know. I don't want to complain like oh it was too hard because uh, you know I I did it. I got a little better at it and it was fine. It's just that I don't mind when games are too hard if it's fun like learning the mechanics. But this was like one off thing that in my opinion didn't control particularly well. And I remember I had one moment where I had like one or two left and it was like down to the last few seconds and I had plenty of shots. I would fire and it was a flamethrower. It would just be like. Psh- so I ended up missing like one of the lanterns, and it just counted against me. And I just remember like being frustrated. Definitely not the worst mini game, but I don't know. Um, as far as my favorite level goes, that's hard. Again, I like the aesthetic and the idea of this level overall, but maybe I was just in a bad place, and maybe it's just my internet connection. But uh, each individual level found like a unique way to frustrate me, um, just with the mini games being kind of weird, or the or the the thief. Uh, skills not quite lining up. Um, I guess I liked the uh, the intro level, like getting into the actual like main area of the swamp, because that was cool. Because it was just a lot of uh, like rail sliding and um, jumping around like leaves and stuff, and climbing up like a path and taking out these sneaky voodoo guards. I, I like that. I'll say that was my favorite level, just the lead up to uh, the level at large. So. Talking about, you know, kind of the, the frustration with dying and whatnot in this area, I think a lot of that probably comes from the fact that this is a water area. You know, if you, you take a fall off of a rail or something, you miss your jump, you're going to die pretty much 90% of the time, uh, unless you have a lucky charm. Going back to our last episode, we talked about um, going through the safes, getting all the bottles... Did everyone, or did anyone, rather, get all the bottles and all the safes in this area? I No. I think I did. You got two? Okay, so I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but the one that I do remember being extremely helpful, uh, I can't remember if it was in this area or actually maybe the last area, but there is a safe that prevents you from losing any health if you fall into water. So, I think the bottles aren't tied to specific levels, because I... I think they're progression-based. I went back to the first world and got some of the bottles and safes there, and I got that, the one you were talking about in World 1. Okay, so maybe that's where it was at. I couldn't remember. Um, I just know that it wasn't relevant in the desert. Uh, What's it called? Sunset Snake Eyes. There's no water there, as far as I can remember, so there's other than one level. So there really wasn't a need for me to, to notice it, but I noticed it a lot um, in the swamp area during Vicious Voodoo. So, like, when you guys are talking about, you know, oh, I was frustrated because I wasn't snapping to the, you know, ledge or whatever, I didn't have really any of that, and I just wanted to clarify, I think part of it, the reason why I was able to just solely enjoy the platforming, enemy designs, and everything else is because I wasn't dying if I fell in the water. I wouldn't if even lose some lucky charm. Just it would just bounce him back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that like, sounds better. Back. Yeah, that um, sounds better. So, uh, moving forward, uh, I think what's relevant to this is our least favorite level. Um, I'll let you start, John. You kind of already talked about a little bit your least favorite being the, I think you said the Piranha uh, oh, boat yes. level. Mm-hmm. So far, and any uh, reason for that, other than I guess Kurt kind of talked about that controls were a little shoddy. Did you have similar feelings about that? Well, it took a few tries to get used to the controls. I kept I kept chasing piranhas in locations that I realized I shouldn't. That were just time waste instead of just staying closer to the area where the keys located, where they pop out. I realized that was that was where I should go, but mostly that. My dislike for that level came from finishing it and then saying try again at the same time. So gotcha. But it's kind of on me. But still, that's just that's just is what did it for me. Okay. Spawn so camper. It was like the the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, spawn camper. Yeah. Um, you spawn killing. Yeah, of with, course. With, why? why there's not? spawn. Why wouldn't I? A lit- <laughs> literal <laughs> spawn. Doubles. It's all connected. Um, why wouldn't I? That was the goal of the game. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Why are we getting oil from piranhas? They are they robots? No, 
I mean, there's or just the bio thing, chunk. you know. We use it to fuel our flame. I mean, no, but we used to use <laughs> oil from whales for you know lanterns and stuff. So that's just. Sure. I, yeah, this did come out 19 years ago. It was a different time. I'm just telling myself right. that's what it is. There's a lot of Their things body... in this game that don't make <laughs> logical sense. It, it, I mean... Their body conversion... Yeah, I'm not actually, actually like... <laughs> I'm not actually, like, knocking this game for, like, realism. That, mm. But I, I do think it's humorous that they're like, oh, we, we need a mechanic. Um, oil. <laughs> I don't know. That's funny. Bipedal raccoon that steals stuff. I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Morales create oil for flamethrowers. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you get it. <laughs> so, Joseph, what would your least favorite level be? Um, there was one level, I think it was called, like, Descent into Danger, where the whole level is, like, it's one long hallway, and then it loops back over on top of it, so it's all just, like, in the same area. But there are bottles where you would have to, like, go to the top of the area, and then jump down and make your way back up again. And I did that an awful lot or i would just fall a lot so i ended up trekking through the level like over and over and over again and it just got mm. kind of frustrating I, i'll be honest i don't really remember that area um, was um the one where bentley was talking about how there's like she's making soup and yeah. there's hands and bones in it i, I do remember yeah. that and you're like climbing along walked in bones and stuff my wife walked in like right when that lion like started and she was like <laughs> What are you playing? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm playing a, I'm playing a kids game from the early 2000s. She's like, is this? Why is this kids? <laughs> why are there body parts? She was very upset. Ooh, about that. It's a different time. They were already dead, so it's okay. She's just, she's like digging up the corpses or whatever, and I don't know. It's okay because they're already dead. That's her. Yeah, she's putting them. <laughs> grave robbing is. You're trying to make this a lot better. Yeah, grave robbing is not as bad as murder. She's recycling. Um, it's fine. I mean. <laughs> So, um, I, this, I don't know if the, I would say this is my least favorite level, but I, I had to go and look up just to make sure I knew what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I did have a lot of frustration with this level, though, because, so I enjoyed some of the platforming, but there are a lot of moments where, um, if you wanted to get the bottles, you would have to jump to something that's inaccessible and then, you know, die or just backtrack way back in the map. And, um... And it's not like, oh, I, I goofed up, I missed this, so now I have to backtrack to get it. No, you'd have to go two-thirds the way through the level, jump down to the beginning of the level on this itty-bitty platform, and then continue with the rest of the level. And assuming it, it just, you made the jump. Assuming what was that? I'm sorry. Assuming you made the jump. Exactly, yeah. And so I completely get that. Um, I think the only reason why I didn't pull out here was the ghost level. No, no, I said that's kind of how uh, Joe's the level Joe said was his least favorite was. There are a lot of bottles. So you'd like go underneath the platform the enemies are on, and then you'd climb up and go above the platform. Yeah. But there are a bunch of bottles on the platform. So you'd have to like jump down, and get the platforms, and then climb back up. And that, that yeah. kind of thing's like throughout the game. Yeah. So um, I, I'd, I'd say, that honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, that probably is my least favorite level in this area. It's something that I've thankfully forgotten about. And Joseph, you kind of brought it back to my attention. Um, that's probably the yeah. level that stood out to me danger. in a negative way. Um, I would, I would agree with that. How about you, Kurt? Anything that really stood out as just awful? My least favorite one was the, the snake level is the, it's called door to the beast or something. And I, strictly because I think that had the most overwater platforming and I did not have that save me ability, nor did I have the foresight to just mash the button to make it work. So I died. I think I gamed over two or three times, and I was getting actively frustrated. And yeah, it, it was a bad time. But I've already talked about that, so we can move on. Um, oh, wait, I want to talk about one more thing. When the snake is chasing you, that's cool. But they force the camera to be behind you again. And even if you turn the camera, they'll spin it back. Mm-hmm. I really don't like when games force me to have a certain perspective. Like, I get that it's cinematic. So if it's like an Uncharted game, and it's cinematic, you're just going to be, like, running. A bunch of cool stuff's going to happen. Maybe you have to, like, make a jump, but you're not going to have to, like, platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I found it really difficult to platform. I promise I like this game. I'm not trying to just, like, whine about everything, but, like, this area in particular, I just found incredibly frustrating, um, and that sort of culminated at the end, but I won't I won't rush you on that. Right, just thinking yeah, about how um, much he loves Crash Bandicoot. I do like Crash Bandicoot. <laughs> um, 
That's what the snake that. level reminded me of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a couple of moments of frustration, but overall, again, I had the water save ability, so I, I never got... I think I died one time, and I stayed ahead enough of the snake that he didn't kill me or anything, but I, I do definitely get the, the frustration from that. I was too enamored by how cool it was that this giant snake showed up and was, you know, spitting poison, I guess, venom at me, and that was really cool for me. Um... Like I said, I think I enjoy pretty much all of this area with the exception of the Descent into Darkness that Joseph mentioned. Um, so, bringing us, I guess, to the midpoint of this area, we've discussed pretty much all of the early levels in the first half of this area. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, the each chapter is divided into two halves. There's a hub world um, where you're allowed to kind of attack enemies, collect coins. Sometimes there's lives um, or a lucky charm, which provides you an extra hit before you die. Uh, and the hub world is split into two halves. You have to collect a certain number of keys before you can progress to the second half of the hub world. Uh, assuming you've played through all the levels that we just discussed, you can now move on to the second half of the hub world. And every second half is accessed through these keys, and there's some unique way um, that the next area is going to be accessed. You know, we talked about in the first area, we had a cannon uh, that would shoot us. So there's a generator you have to destroy. There's a car that will bust through a wall. Lots of cool cartoony stuff like that. Um, this area actually probably has my favorite in the entire game, which is the snake that we just discussed. I just finished playing through the level that Kurt was discussing with the snake, running from him, finally got away from him, and... Uh, open these little padlocks and the gate bursts open and our snake friend that we just saw comes out and busts a hole into the next area. And I was just, I was so frustrated because like, I don't know how I'm supposed to get to the next area. And I realized, Oh, I have all my keys. Let me go open this door real quick. What's going to happen. And you know, every time that we had one of these new areas, uh, the second half of the hub world, I was always excited to see what was going to happen, how I was going to progress to the next area. Did anyone else, enjoy this one thoughts on this compared to the others yeah i thought this one was really cool um because i think it did a good job of making everything feel connected they they kind of have a map they're like oh you were here and now you're going here but it still very much feels like oh now you're in this level and now you're in this level and they just share like a theme but this was like oh no that thing from that other level is here now and this is all mm -hmm. like the same place it came from that direction i, th I thought it was cool i like that Anyone else have any feelings about this, strong or otherwise? I thought it was weird how he just kind of showed up and then broke the door open and left. No interest in yeah, Sly anymore. <laughs> well, he, he was broken free because when you start the snake level, uh, I don't know if it's Sly or Bentley, but they're like, uh, I wonder what, I wonder who they're trying to keep out, and the other one says, or what they're trying to keep in. So I think uh, yeah. that snake was like a prisoner. I mean, probably like a pet, like a prisoner. And that snake's like, I'm free. I'm going to go mm -hmm. eat some, um, I don't know dog people in Vegas or whatever. Or rat zombies in the swamp. No, I I'm put on sure a he's sick of rat zombies. He to Alaska. He got, he got that joke, John. That was a good joke. Is he a solid snake? Yeah, he's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, thinking about... Um, I, I mentioned these zombie mice uh, i touched on it very very briefly what did you guys think of the enemy designs in this area every d area has its own unique enemies some are a little more similar to other areas not necessarily reskin but you know their actual attack patterns or uh you know ways of finding you on the map are fairly similar um this area had a mosquito it had a swamp monster thing had and ghosts. it had a had ghosts. Mm -hmm. of ghosts. That's kind of cool. And it also had a uh, rat zombie guy. And the spiders. Um, and spiders. And spiders. Spooky spiders. Does anyone want to kind of tackle what they think about, you know, the enemies? Uh, if yeah, anyone has strong it. feelings about it, that's fine. Go ahead, John. So spiders weren't that bad. So the spiders would just fall from the trees um, randomly when you're going through the swamp areas. And then you just hit them. You can normally outpace the spiders on that in that regard. The ghosts come out of tombstones and they continue spawning until there's three of them, at which point they will just chase you around until you either kill them 
or take out the tombstone, then kill them, and that'll stop their respawning. So those two enemies, not that bad at all. I kind of like them. I don't remember much about the the rats, but I don't remember them being an issue. The enemy I liked the least out of this area was the mosquitoes, just because I just thought that I they were in reach when they weren't, and then mm -hmm. or they would cancel my attack and stab me. And then the worst part about the mosquitoes is they're not doing it for food. Uh, after they murder you, they spit the blood out. So they're not even they're not even hungry. <laughs> they're just doing it to murder you. So so Sly's blood is purple. Um, I think we should be worried about him. Hi, John. Uh, Joe Vamp, uh, talk about the mosquitoes. Carry on his man. legacy. So something I, I thought about it last time, but I don't think I brought it up, is the people who don't have flashlights notice you a lot faster than the characters who do have flashlights. <laughs> They'll aggro you so much easier. But if you just like step into the area of the flashlight is the only way that somebody could actually notice you. If the guys that have flashlights anyway. Too. It's really funny. It's like they're... That's why they have to use flashlights, I guess. They're, like, blind otherwise. <laughs> the vision is so bad. Sight. Why are, um, rather, sorry, not why, the, the rats with the flashlights, they have, like, voodoo laser powers. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever, like, caught and then able to escape? It seemed like any time I got caught, I literally was vaporized, like, in a second. I could not so, evade those attacks. I hey, John's try. back. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it crashed and then it came back up. That's okay. Yeah. We'll just keep on trucking. Hope hopefully your video will show up too. Oh, yeah. you can't see my video. No, I can't see. Not, you. Well, I can't see you. Okay. Well, if jo if, if Joe can see you, he's recording. It's fine. We can move oh, on. Out it's, <laughs> it's my fault. Um. So, so as far as the enemies with flashlights, I don't think I was ever able to evade them, with the exception of probably the very first area, the starfish. No, 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 the starfish guy, actually. It was, he didn't have a flashlight. He didn't have a flashlight. So, no. no, as far as the flashlight enemies, I'm pretty sure if I got caught, I was dead, unless I had a lucky charm, and then I was able to, you know, smack them around. Did anyone else have any chance to kill them before the, they... The only way I've ever been able to do it is I got the decoy ability, and I would stand just outside of their sight, pop mm. a decoy out, and they would start attacking that, and I would move around and hit them that way. So many cool sounding <laughs> things locked behind <laughs> an excessive amount of collectibles that I just chose not to get. Should have played the it game. It took better. like three minutes to get them. Dude, I'm telling you, I would. I got like one, okay, in the swamp area, and I got like the dive, and I was like, oh, this is kind of terrible and not useful at all. So then I tried to get on the next level, and I got all but one. I looked, and it was in the distance, and it was, I would have to redo the whole level. And I was like, I'm not redoing this whole level to get this one thing. And then I did the I'm next level, and I got another ability, and it was a spin, like the rolly around. And I'm like, this is also not helpful. And so I'm just, I didn't know that I didn't know that they were saved, invincible, and create a clone of yourself for later. I might have tried a little harder. Okay, guys. I think <laughs> they're literally is... the only two abilities I got the whole game. <laughs> the whole is... point of the game is I'm going to go reclaim my family's like book that was taken from us, and Kurt to was like. They don't I'm make it clear. Sly is a poop head who doesn't care about his family. So. <laughs> they don't make it clear that the pages are in the safe. They're just like, ooh, who, who knows what's in the safe? And I was never going to open one of those safes. So the only way I found out is that you guys told me. And you cannot make me feel bad for not doing something that I would not have known about. I will make did, you feel bad. The game didn't. I mean, you can try to make me feel bad. I'm not going to feel bad about it. Even you after you a... knew they contained them, you didn't go back and get all of them. You did a I good got two job of them, and they weren't good. You did a good job, you Kurt. You didn't look up a walkthrough. You did a good job. Yeah, Ryder. Mr. uses a walkthrough for every game he plays. I didn't look up What? <laughs> it's true. Don't don't look <laughs> when, it up. When I used the walkthrough? <laughs> I'm going to keep going now. Um, this part makes right. the blooper real, guys. No, don't take that out. So <laughs> What's saying it? <laughs> We talked about uh, most of the mini games earlier. I don't know if I'd really qualify this as a mini game, but it deviates from typical gameplay. So I think it's fair enough to call it a mini game. Uh, there's a level where you're on a ghost I, ship. I, yeah, I don't know what to call it other than like it's like a Star call Wars it, like speeder. Like call it a shooter scooter. Shooter scooter. Yeah, we'll call it that. Um, it's a twin stick shooter. In 3D, I, I don't know. I, I really, 
So I didn't love this level, but I love the idea behind it. Because if you go back to the very first world, we're introduced to the twin stick shooter mechanics on a top-down, not 2D, but it's a top-down format. It's pretty easy to learn, pretty easy to understand. Um, and it slowly develops until eventually we're at the point in the uh, third world where it's 3D. And so we're able to spin around, you know, in place, you know, move all over the map, actually directionally, and also shoot. And I didn't really love the level itself. I had some frustration from having to restart a couple of times. But I really like the idea that they introduced you to it early in the game. You know, again, this is ultimately, it's a game for everyone, but, you know, more geared towards children, I would say. And so children probably don't understand the mechanics. It's something new to them. This might be their first video game ever. And so it's a really nice way for that they, you know, introduce it from a top-down perspective. Like, here's this mechanic. Hold on to it. We're going to show you it again later, but a slightly more complicated way where you're not just shooting at these crabs and aren't going to harm you, but you have your normal waves of enemies coming at you. Um, I really like that. What do you guys think about uh, the mini games in general, or you know, specifically what I just discussed with the uh, scooter mission? Yo, think Kurt, you can go first. Oh, 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 me? Ah, yeah. Um, I liked it. I liked it. I thought that there was a moment at the end of the level. There's like three or so gravestones that are just constantly spawning like <coughs> ghost after ghost. That was like excessive. Like overall, I really enjoyed that. It's probably twin six shooter mini games are probably my favorite mini games. Um. I'm going to call them that. Those are probably my favorites. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about the other mini games, but if anybody has something to say about the shooter scooter, now's your time. Great. Um, I'm going to talk <laughs> about the other mini games. Um, it, I might be thinking about the next area. Was there the Escort Murray mini game in this one, or is that the next area? So I think that's, that's the next, yeah, area. I think that's the next I, area. I think we've pretty much discussed all of them uh, in yeah, full. I just yeah. wanted yeah. to really talk about that one specifically. Um, I liked it. Two thumbs up. Yeah, it was fun. I think the only thing that bothered me was when you were on the ship at the beginning. I couldn't tell if I was hitting the rails of the ship or if my bullets just like didn't have enough range. But I did find yeah. out eventually that you don't. That there's a certain range that the bullets will actually go before they just kind of pop. That was like so the only really thing like, that was frustrating to me, but I enjoyed the mechanics. I thought it controlled well. So I, I think that's pretty much most of our bigger areas. Uh, if anyone has a mission in particular that we you know miss and you want to talk about, feel free. Now's your time. Um, but I think that pretty much covers this area in full, with the exception of the boss fight. Um, this boss was called Miss Ruby. Uh, I was the only person who played this game growing up. And I remember this was my least favorite area of the game at that point. And playing it now, it was the area that I remembered the most of. And I think it's because I had to play every single level so much. And, you know, the boss fight started and I was like, oh, no. Like, I, I could just, I felt like, <laughs> like, I felt like I shrunk down like three feet shorter. <laughs> and I was like, no, not again. No, Miss Ruby, please. Um I, I love the music. I love the environment. Everything about the boss fight was amazing. But the actual rhythm part of this, uh, this is a rhythm game boss fight, is, I don't know. I, I don't want to say it's bad, because I, I wasn't playing the original PlayStation 2 version. I was playing it on the PS Now version. I'm sure Kurt is going to tell he has the exact same opinion on this. Yeah, I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask like Joe and John if they had trouble with the beats lining up with like the beats where you had to press the button lining up with the actual beats of the music because there was like no point where I felt that that was happening. But I was giving it benefit of the doubt and saying that it was because I was streaming the game and not playing it like you know downloaded. As someone who has no sense of rhythm, I played this boss a lot. So. I how do you have no sense of rhythm when you're like Hatsune Miku King? Like, what See, are you talking the, about? The thing about the other rhythm games I play is they have visual cues. Like, there will be an X flying across the screen, and there's an X where it's supposed to land, and I know to press it right there. There's very little visual cue in this boss fight, for me, anyways, because I know it's supposed to be like when the buttons are getting close to him, 
but it seemed like it was awfully precise, I guess. And it was yeah, just harder I'd, for me. I dissected why that didn't work for me, like the visuals. So the problem is in most rhythm games, it's usually like a 2D thing where you're either, it's either like flat and you're looking mm-hmm. on top of it or it's like side to side or something like that. Yeah. But this was three-dimensional environment where you're heading forward at like a, di- a diagonal. Yeah. So there are... You're dealing with depth perceptions. Yeah, the prompts are moving towards you on the Z-axis at a diagonal. And I think a big problem, like, if that's not enough, is that, as far as I could tell, the notes don't reach you at the exact same time because it's based on, like, Sly's perspective because you're, like, dodging the prompts. Yeah. And so because because of the angle, the notes that were on his left would reach him sooner than the notes that were on his right or something like that. And so the timing was slightly different, even based strictly on visual cues. Um, and I had a lot of trouble with that. John, I keep I keep seeing your mic light up, and I feel like I'm talking over you. I apologize. Hi. So, so to answer your question to us, I I don't believe it lined Sorry. up very well with the game, the music, and the clicking the buttons. However, after the first one or two times, I got really focused, and I honestly don't remember the music at that point. However. <laughs> This is where the it not noticing me pressing a button came into play. So specifically, the first time it has you go circle, square, circle. I know how to click a button, okay? I know, what, <laughs> I know how to click circle, square, and then circle. But this game decided that I didn't know how to click circle that, that second time. And after I did it a few times, I realized that I'm just going to click circle two times after I click the square and see if it kicks me off for doing it twice. It did not, so I took advantage of that and continued to do that throughout the rest of the boss fight, so it made it a lot easier. But I would say that it it did annoy me that it resets you all the way back to the beginning of that, even when you make it to the third (laughs) phase. So, But I mean, it makes sense, but it, it was just... I was like, mm, I don't want to do this again. <laughs> you know. This so, boss, oh, you go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, this boss also talks really slowly. I don't know yeah. if you guys got a game over. Oh, I did. Had to listen mm-hmm. to her twice. It was so slow. And also another thing that Kurt and I were talking about, about the um, how it, like the notes get closer to you, it also changes the delay based on how far you've gotten into the level because you're getting closer to her. So whenever, mm-hmm. like whenever the first time you do it, there's a lot of delay because you can see the notes coming at you from a distance. And when you get to like the peg that's right in front of her, they're just, it's just like instantaneous. And I got hit a few times from that one just because I wasn't ready for the notes to be like on you right then. I got hit at the very last note of the very last phase because you get like right in front of her and she's like triangle and then yep. you die. And I'm just like, oh, well... Mm-hmm. Time to do the whole thing, including the the tiny platforming section. Yeah, like they could at least not make you do that every time. I mean, goodness. Um, yeah. Spider, please talk. I have more to say. You're, but please you're talk. Good. You're good. So, <laughs> I, I just wanted to touch before it, it uh it's not relevant anymore. Rewinding a little bit, as far as your question, Kurt. Uh, the reason why I brought up the distinction between Kurt and I's experience and Joseph and John's experience. Um, the way that we're playing the game. So Joseph and John are playing the original PlayStation 2 version, uh, whereas Kurt and I are playing the collection for 1, 2, and 3 of Sly Cooper. They're remastered, upscales. PS3 version. Hmm? For the the PS3, PS3 exactly. Um, We're playing it on PS now, uh, so we are streaming, but that doesn't account for the audio delay. Um, Going a little bit further into this, Kurt and I are also, I, I guess, musically inclined more so than John and Joseph. Sorry, <laughs> <What>? but <laughs> no. <laughs> no. But Kurt is a uh, music major currently in his second year, wrapping up his master's. Uh, he has his bachelor's in music education as well. Looking I'm, for a job if anybody yeah, needs to. Someone hit him up, please. Uh, <laughs> I do not have a degree in music, but I've been 
playing music since I think the age of like seven or eight is when I started taking piano. So anyways, I think we're a little bit more. I've been singing since I was at least two. So, okay. 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 True. <laughs> so, played the recorder in sixth grade. So that anyway, wasn't go ahead. Shame these two, but it was to say that I also noticed something was very, very wrong playing this, and I wasn't sure if it's intentional or not. But rhythm games typically you want the actual uh, action to line up with the music. When you're playing Guitar Hero, you don't want you know this awesome guitar riff to just not line up entirely whenever the dot's going through. I meant to make that joke and I forgot. <laughs> you. Exactly. About but, Guitar Hero. <laughs> so I, I went and looked up this issue to see if it was an issue, or if, if I'm just, you know, not playing music actively for the past two years has just destroyed my ears. And it turns out in the collection, they remastered the music. And when they did this, it threw off the music by just an itty bit. But as the song progresses, it gets worse and worse. And so that's why if you're playing the PS2 version, it actually lines up. So when the music goes dumped, 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 your actual movements are going to be dumped, 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 hitting the buttons, whatever that button combination is. Whereas on the PS3 version, it goes, it, it's like a syncopated, like off rhythm. So it, it doesn't quite line up. Uh, so because of that, it was extremely hard for me to, to not want to play a traditional rhythm game rhythm game style and hit it you know the, the way it's supposed to line up um i ended up turning off the music for the first like portion of the level and it got substantially easier because i wasn't hearing this music that just wasn't lining up uh the other part as far as the actual i guess gameplay part of it, ignoring the music and how that didn't line up the I don't, I don't really want to call them hit boxes, but the timing is so precise on, you know, lining up with X, square, circle, triangle, whatever you're supposed to hit, that like you guys said, I mean, you, you can hit the button, and it'll be like, nah, nah, homie, you didn't do it. Because you might have done it a millisecond too early or too late. And the way that this game works, you know, there's not a health bar. If you don't have a lucky charm on your back, it's over with. And it's not like, you know, Guitar Hero... There's, I think, a pretty good amount of, of leeway. You know, there's one circle that's, you know, stays here, and then you have the actual music moving towards you. And as long as there's some overlap, it's going to count. Exactly. Everyone do it with us. Just like Oh, that, that. works. Yeah. Uh, as long as you overlap <laughs> at some point with Guitar Hero, it's going to count it. But with Sly, it doesn't work the same way. Also, other rhythm games, you don't lose the game when you miss one note. Um and so I think that it was a really cool idea. I love that every one of these boss fights feels extremely different. I love that they're like, you know what? We're going to have a rhythm game uh, for a boss fight. Amazing idea. I'm sure the PS2 version would have felt a little bit cleaner. Um, but th my enjoyment was just ruined purely because of the remix music, which made the rhythm not actually feel rhythmic. <laughs> and the hitboxes, for lack of a better word, being way too small, and the game is so unforgiving that I did not want to have to sit through three minutes of dialogue with... I mean, I love the the, the voice actress for uh, Miss Ruby. It sounded like a uh, Kathy Bates, almost. I love Kathy Bates, and that's what it kind of sounded like. It didn't sound anything like a Haitian person to me. It sounded more like <laughs> someone from the United States Southeast, but it's fine. I, love the I don't think the implications but, that she's from there. I think the implications that she's out hiding she, there. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, you know, that's the voodoo is, you know, didn't originate there, but has a strong, you know, cultural root there. So I think it's part of that for sure. Um, but anyway, I enjoyed everything about the boss fight except for the fight. Except um, the mechanics of the yeah, boss fight. So, so really, the, the boss fight. Uh, about to blow this wide open, Ryder, if you, if you let me. Yeah, go um, ahead. Hit it. The way to beat this boss fight without dying is just to mash whatever prompt you see coming towards you as fast as possible. And as soon as it passes you, just immediately switch to mashing the other prompt. That's the only way I got through it. I didn't get past the first section by like actually timing the presses, even with like muting the music. It was just like yeah. wild for me. So I'm literally just like, 
like <laughs> smashing my buttons as fast as possible. And it works. Exactly what and, I did, yeah. Yeah, see, me and John got it. Special to play it, I guess. Broke the game. I'd be interested to see either you guys play it on an authentic PS2, like John and I did. See if honestly, I don't. Ryder, they broke the game. I honestly don't know if I listened to that boss fight with sound. I've, I don't remember the, the music. So <laughs> I, like, I, I, I was either. Hard. I was either that <laughs> tunnel vision so hard, or I was doing something else while playing this game. I honestly don't remember, but so, I just did the sequence as fast as I could, and it worked until the circle square circle one. And then after that, I didn't, you know, it worked. Other than I'd click the wrong button or something. So as far as the uh, this area, I think that about wraps it up. We beat our good friend Miss Ruby. Assuming you have the patience to sit through it, uh, she tells you you'll never beat Panda King. Pretty much the same spiel that we've gotten from every other boss. Um, and he is in China. I don't really know if she gives us any more. I think that's pretty that's much the Taiwan. basic spiel. It's funny yes. they all know their place, though. They're like, oh, well, he's beat the mm-hmm. frog. Well, I don't know if he's going to beat me, but I know he's not going to beat the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the panda. Hierarchy. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's like, well, I'm number three, so you're not going to beat number four. Um, so we move on to our next chapter, which is called A Fire in the Sky. Um, we're going to take on Panda King. Uh, before we go into the chapter, I just want to say that the title screen popped up. Again, beautiful, cartoonish, same way as everything else. Feel like Saturday morning cartoons. I discussed that before, but this one actually scared me because I had like some like innate like primal fear, like Ugh, and I, I didn't know why. And I thought about it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, I know that name. It's a name from a horror movie from the '90s." It's just like one <laughs> yes. of the, one of yes, the few movies that's actually scary. Um, that was from, a joke I decided opinion. to leave out. <laughs> uh, so, if anyone's watching this and want to be very terrified go watch that you'll be bored for like an hour and a half like the first like 20 minutes and the last like 15 are amazing moving on aliens it it is about aliens not about panda king (laughs) Um, and this is about panda king not about aliens so (laughs) uh we're going to beat up poe the kung fu panda and the exactly yeah and the king kunlin mountains i think that's what we heard um this area is really a culmination of everything up to this point in the game. Um, it's not the climax of the game, but I think it's really even more so than the last world, a taste of everything that we've done up until this point, as far as gameplay. Um, I don't think there's anything that really felt new to me. There's a new stealth mechanic that's introduced from the, previous chapter at the very end you get a new chapter from the previous uh the devious raccoonus and that allows us to go invisible um it is necessary but as far as the actual worlds themselves or the levels themselves i think they're just a little more i like revamp missions from earlier you know reskinned and you know a little bit sprinkled on top to make them slightly different um what do you guys really think about cool this aesthetic. area Yes, yes. So, so it's really pretty. Uh, you're up in the mountains, of course. Uh, really snowy. You know, there's if chimpanzees, uh, gorillas, and some. I think there's an orangutan, but it didn't really like orangutan to me. But we'll keep moving. Uh, and they all do kung fu. And that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did you guys think about this area, just from a top-down view overall? What do you think? I this, liked the new enemies. I liked the new enemies. Just. <clears throat> the baboon that uses the stick to try to attack you, that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Baboon, um, that's what I was forgetting. Okay, I was worried you were about to call me out and say it was a different monkey. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> a it was a baboon. One. <laughs> and, um, it was like Stickiest Baboonus was its name, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, I, overall I did like this area. All of the enemies, I did I did enjoy their new concepts that they threw our way. So they were, there was another monkey, I can't remember what kind, but it was throwing other monkeys at us that would yeah. turn into snowballs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, was about to I thought that, that was very unique and funny at the same time. I loved it. And then um, another aspect that I am surprised that, like you had said, the invisibility, I feel like that wasn't used enough. However, we are closer to the end of the game, but I felt like 
that could have been used a little bit more mm-hmm. throughout these levels because I think it was only one or two of the levels that it actually came in handy. Other times I just thought felt like it was a skill that we had but never really needed. So, I, but as I you was did thinking, say, over, I was thinking that the. Other ones. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. And I can't see your video, so I have no idea when you're like oh. <laughs> taking taking a breath to keep talking. So I'm just guessing. I apologize. You're fine. Um, I thought the invisibility was really cool. I thought it was also just like a huge step up because it's like, oh, you can land carefully. It's like, oh, you can slide. Now you can turn invisible. I was like, oh, okay, sh- sure. I read that in a book. Now <laughs> I can do that. But now you guys are telling me that there's like hidden skills where you can create a copy of yourself. So we're just in Naruto now. So it doesn't mm-hmm. really matter. It's it's like a cardboard um, cutout, to be fair. Yeah. You're not like... Is it's it? Not like it's like a one-to-one. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, no. yeah. Kurt, did you get the ability in this area that allows you to um, take two hits from a boss before they do damage? I got two abilities in this game. One of them know. allowed me to move forward slightly <laughs> faster, and the other one allowed me to move forward slightly faster if I held it long enough. Oh, okay. So because I stopped I'm... getting new abilities. I made that ability, yeah, but I was just curious if you had gotten it or not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was like, man, that's two. Is that one of the two I missed? (laughs) There is a really good ability. I don't know who all got this one, but there's one that actually... So so the two bigger causes of death, I think, in this game are going to be falling in water. Um, We've already covered that one. There's an ability that prevents you from dying from falling in water. And the second one is falling just into a bottomless pit, falling off of a ledge into, you know, the abyss, wherever that leads you to. Um... There's actually an ability that you find which allows you to defy gravity, as Bentley puts it. And so if you jump off the ledge, you cannot die. I mean, you know, if you just jump off the mountainside, you'll fall and go, wing, right back up to your previous spot. So that is also extremely helpful in this area. I don't know if anyone else got it. But kind of do you complete this game? Did it do what? you complete this game? Did you get all the abilities? I got everything. I, I think I technically hit like 90% completion because okay. uh, you do have to go back and redo time trials. them all like time mm-hmm. trials and I didn't feel like doing that but uh, I did everything else as far as the the secret abilities and whatnot. I wanted to get the saves. Okay. And I, I know as I long missed. as you don't tell me there's a lava one, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, no, There was not a lava uh, I, got, I don't know, safeguard I don't know what to call did it. Did you get it and 100%? Maybe so. Um, so I don't want to go any further into the abilities because we've, I think we've beat that dead horse. Uh, we know that <laughs> no. Kurt unfortunately missed out. There's, um, there's maybe one ability next that I was game he'll get them all. using all the time. Once Which you got, one? once I got the ability that lets you just move faster, it's essentially just a fast forward button mm. from like a Pokemon emulator. I was holding that down almost the entire time I was playing the game. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. Speed um, runner right here. Yep. <laughs> So, was there any level that really stood out to you guys? Any anything that you particularly loved? Um, oh, I'll let loved. Kurt go first. Flaming Temple of Flames. That's okay, you want to talk the about this level? <laughs> oh, first of all, it's got the greatest name ever. Um, also, a horror movie from the '90s, I believe. And I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just liked it. I like the idea of. Uh, I meant to mention this last time, but uh, you get the first ability after you beat. Uh, Frogman, um, and it's an ability from ancestor Ryochi uh, Cooper. And I realize that I'm kind of blending cultures, and I don't mean to do that. But I, I was like, I super want just like, um, like a Japanese themed um, like Sly Cooper. That would be super awesome. And this is China, which is different, but it it had that like running across the tops of like um, like Asian buildings um, and that kind of like vibe and like the the I don't know. I thought it was super cool. Um, and then you, there's like statues of like um, what are they called? Uh, like Japan or uh, like Asian demons? Oh, uh, Oni. Help me out. Yeah, like Onis and stuff. It's, there's it's Japanese yokais. version, but yeah. yokais. That's what I was thinking. Maybe that's Japanese. I don't know. There's statues also of like Japanese. that kind of thing, like demons and dragons. And I'm really not trying to be insensitive. I'm sorry. I'm just not <laughs> very educated, apparently. Um, yeah, I really liked it. And then you get in the the hall that has all the monkeys who are like training and like swinging nunchucks around all at once. And it's just and they're standing like these pillars. And it's just makes your ears bleed, but it's really 
interesting just seeing enemies like living their lives and not just standing there waiting to kill you. I don't know. I like mm-hmm. that a lot. I like that entire level. I have a fun fact for that level, actually. Okay. So, like you had mentioned, there's the enemy standing on top of the poles practicing their nunchuck moves, and so you go above them to get to the next uh, section. However, mm-hmm. if you mistakenly fall, you can fall on top of one of them and just stand there. It won't hit you. It won't attack you. You can just stand there on top of his head just in the room <laughs> until, until you get tired of it, and then you can jump down and try to go to the next area again. But I found that very hilarious. Out of nowhere, Focused. I was just standing on his head. Yeah, he was dedicated. So, And I just wanted to share that. So uh, that level... I guess I'll just go ahead and hit it. So this world in general, I did not like. And really? I, it was probably my least favorite. Um, probably my second favorite. This might have been my I favorite it's world, my least favorite. Really? Yeah, Joe? Mm-hmm. So, so I didn't like the music. Um, I loved the music in the previous world. A lot of it sounded like A Link to the Past to me. Um, like the, uh, there's almost like, this like really dark, ominous, foreboding sound that sounded like the beginning of Blink of the Past to me. Um, I really liked the soundtrack in the last world. This one was much quieter and just not interesting to me. A lot of it sounded like Spyro and not necessarily in a good way. Again, I know I'm comparing to Spyro, but this is the world where really, more than the rest, I was like, this feels like Spyro because there's yeah. uh, like a level in Spyro where you're like in the Tibet, uh, Tibetan like mountain range and like mm-hmm. it, it felt very similar all the way around. Like, the enemies, like, mannerisms and stuff after they kill you, it all felt, like, goofier than the rest. Um, more cartoony, I guess. Not necessarily a bad thing, but for me, it didn't do it. I know I had to uh, redo a lot of these levels because I was going for the 100% on the bottles. And these levels are not accessible. Like, like once you jump off a platform, like, back to the beginning if you want to redo it. Like, there's some areas like some chapters previously where you'd have like one or two levels like that but nearly every single level in this chapter if you miss something you had to go back and so for me trying to 100 percent the uh chess it was very very tedious for me um now i'm kind of jumping ahead with this because we're trying to talk about favorite levels but i just thinking about it this level in particular stood out to me because i love the aesthetic as far as like the pagoda, the temple, and whatnot, the monkeys training, but I couldn't even focus on it because I had to redo this mission five times just to get all the bottles. So what you're saying is a mechanic that forces you to play through a level multiple times um, in order to get uh, simple progression <laughs> abilities is inherently Jeez. not as fun <laughs> as it would otherwise be if it wasn't there. No, because overall, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I just had trouble with this one world. I mean, it just made you not like probably my second favorite level in the whole game, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So we're talking about favorite levels. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about okay. whatever you want to talk about, John. All right. So. Do you vote for? So, I don't know. On this one. He yeah. doesn't know who you voted for. <laughs> <laughs> what? What do you mean? Yes, I told you voted a good for. Job. You said, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Sorry, that went over my uh, head. Where's your favorite level? Listening. So, favorite level was definitely not the race one, <laughs> but it is the level where we are being chased again by our police officer or Interpol officer counterpart. Mm-hmm. And dragons. I really like that level. I I did enjoy that level a lot. Um, so that would be the one that would do it for me. Again, it just kind of reminds me of the Crash Bandicoot levels where you're just constantly in a, you feel like you're in a rush, you need to get going, you can't stop. It, it really puts on the pressure. Even if even if I did slow down, I'm sure I wouldn't have had an issue in dodging the bullets or anything, but it just instead of just worrying about, you know, the bottles and collecting all that, if you just dedicate just to the level it does feel like you've been put on pressure by the by the officer and trying to avoid the the damage she's trying to deal to you and trying to get through the area as it's you know breaking apart from her shots or just kind of being destroyed in general. So overall, I would say that that would be my favorite for this section. Yeah, it was really cool how she would like break the platform in front of you <laughs> with her gun. 
thought it was just really cool yes. how she interacted with the level. Yeah, this, Joseph, was this, this your favorite cool as well? Level. Um, No, I think my favorite was actually the level where you're like Mission Impossibling your way up a tower and like uh, dodging all the lasers and security beams and stuff. And there was one point at the mm-hmm. end of the level where you had to, you were at the top of a tower and you were looking down. There was all these like sensors and beams going all across and you were just like jumping platform to platform, dodging those. I think that might have been my favorite level. It was also like the one level where you had to use the invisibility because you were put on <laughs> conveyor belts that were like going past mm-hmm. security guards that had lights on them. But I really those enjoyed moments, the Carmelita level too. Those moments where I think the only time that happens again is in like the police station, but when you're descending like series of like lasers and stuff, I had, those are the parts that make me feel like the most like a super sneaky guy, even though essentially you're yeah. just jumping and then and landing yeah. on the next platform. Mm-hmm. But I don't know, it, it, it feels very thematic and that's, um, that's whenever I felt most like I was playing the role of a thief instead of just a wacky, cartoony mascot platformer. The one part that did break the immersion a little bit for me was I played through this level again to try and find all the bottles. And once I got to the end, I was just like running through it and I just jumped straight through all the lasers and you would hit the first one and then the alarms would go off while the lasers would cut off and everything. And before they cut back on as lasers that will damage you, you can reach the bottom. <laughs> so it doesn't really <laughs> That's matter. That's awesome. That's what I figured would happen, but I didn't yeah. want to test it. There you go. I was wondering why why they even felt the need to do that other than to just, I mean, it looks cool, but, you mm-hmm. know, there's no real risk unless, they're not moving or anything, you know, they're, yeah. they're static. If they were moving, it'd be a little bit, or maybe there's one or two that would move across, but since they're all just there, there's no real risk of hitting them twice, like you said, so... Mm-hmm. Like a, it's like a perceived risk to make players like me feel like they're doing something that's cool and dangerous. Mm-hmm. I get that. Exactly. Uh, John, in the Carmelita level uh, that you were just talking about, so I actually, that was one of my favorites as well from this area, if not my favorite. Uh, but another thing that diminished the fun for me was the bottles again. Yeah, it that's why I made sure to bring that up. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't that I had to redo it a whole bunch for the bottles because it wasn't nearly as much as the uh, the level that Kurt was talking about, what was it? Flame. The Flaming Temple of Flames. The Flaming Temple of Flames. So I, it, I didn't have nearly as much of a problem with that as far as getting the bottles. But what really just killed it for me was I got to the end of the level with Carmelita where she's chasing you. And I have all of my bottles and I go up to the safe and Bentley goes, Sly, this language is an owl and I can't crack it until you beat an owl. And that was it. You got to progress to the end of the level. What? And so I just spent like three or four replays doing this and was like, that was just I can't even angry. use this until the end of the game. <laughs> oh my gosh. And come so, back and get it. It's the lava ability. Yeah. It's got to be. Come back and get it. And, and I'll tell you what the ability is once we get to the end of the game. But I, I do understand why they did it because one, the ability is cool and, and two, the next area really didn't allow for you to stop and get bottles. Um, but it, it was very frustrating to go through all the effort of getting every single bottle and then be like, well, I didn't even really need to get them right now. But okay. anywho, uh, <laughs> does anyone have a least favorite level? Um, the race. The race. Okay, interesting. So I was actually going to say, I think this is probably going to pair with mini games. I think mini games are favorites <laughs> and least favorites on pretty much all of these. Funny enough, um, I beat the race on my first try this time. I got, I got it on about my the second try. It wasn't yeah. too bad this time. I got it about the third try, but I overall I just don't like the races. Mm. Did the ice do anything? Because they're like, watch out for the icy patches, but I just drove on them and it was fine. I think it slows more. you down a little bit. Yeah, I, mean, you, I don't works. know. I think it, it slid for me whenever I tried to turn on ice. It would just yeah, kind of drift you, a little bit. Yeah, if you turn on them, it would But it was not. Okay, if you like a fixture like drifting, that that would be kind of cool, but I don't know. Yeah, so this level with the race, it wasn't really different at all from the previous race. Like I said, a lot of these levels were pretty much reskinned. Um, the only real difference was that there was an uh, introduction of ice, like we just said, none of us could really tell a difference. Mm-hmm. And this is really where, despite you know having to go back and redo the levels for the bottles, I tried not to let that influence my overall opinion of this world. Of course it's going to, but <laughs> I think my biggest frustration with this world is just that it feels 
like I said, a, a reskin. Yeah. Up until this point, the first three worlds all had something extremely distinct. You know, if it added like a new type of level, it you hadn't seen it before. I understand you can't necessarily always have new types of levels going forward, but in this area, they reuse the Murray game where you're having to follow Murray and protect him. They reuse the same. It, yes, it's Molly's favorite. So that's why I went ahead and brought this up. Uh, so there's that level with Murray. You have to protect him. It's exactly the same as earlier, um, except for I think he maybe gets hit a little bit faster. If I can, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I think he gets hit a little bit faster than the previous game. I think it's also a little bit longer. Um, the mini game that we just discussed, the racing game, not really a change there other than the introduction of ice. I don't think it's significant enough to make it more fun or mm -hmm. Even really more challenging. It just again feels like a frustrating rehash for most of it. TDS. Uh, exactly. And then I want to say that they add in the twin stick shooter again. Yeah, there's, a, there's a shooter scooter level for sure. Yeah, I think so. And I, I can't remember the specifics of that. Uh, the, oh, you're yes, I do. Remember. The warehouse. It, well, and then you're going like up around like a mountain pass, and there's like the the gorillas or the the big monkeys that are throwing other monkeys at you. And I don't know, it just none of it felt new enough for me, where I think there were three or four mini games in this world, and then the other platforming levels. I didn't really enjoy any of them, except for the Carmelita level. But again, the Carmelita level is a just rescan of a previous level that I enjoyed even more. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know if you guys feel any differently about this, but that's really why this world didn't stand out to me, just because it felt too familiar and not in a good way. I could see that, yeah. yeah. I agree. I don't... I'm sorry, I'm talking over everybody. I don't want to steal your thunder, Ryder, of talking about the transition, but I was really bummed out after the transition happened because this was, like, shaping up to be my favorite level because I really liked the Flaming Temple level and I liked the one Joe was talking about where you're going up to the tower. There might have been one more that were just really good, solid... You know, nothing new, but just solid platforming levels. And then you get to the second area... And I'm pretty sure, quite literally, every single level is, like, a gimmick level. It's it's the ones you just listed. They're, like, mini-games, or they're, like, the Carmelita chase. And it's like, no, I just want well-designed, good Sly Cooper platforming. Like, these are these are cool, but not when they're the majority of what I'm having to do now. I, I found that mm -hmm. frustrating. I didn't find them new or fun um, in any particularly spectacular way. And that's how I felt too. I, that's why this didn't really stand out to me in, like I said, a positive way. Um, in you know, talking about the progression between the first half of the hub world and the second half of the hub world in this chapter, that's another thing. Um, so, the story in one of our neat little cutscenes, Sly tells us that Panda King was actually an orphan growing up in China, made some fireworks, impressed local nobles. They didn't like it, so he decided to blow up their house. <laughs> um, that was cool, interesting enough. You know, he's the demolitions expert of the Furious, or the Furious Five. That's uh, Kung Fu Panda. I'm telling you, Kung Fu Panda <laughs> of, of the Fiendish Five. Um, but so I understand why why they felt the need to include fireworks. Everything we just discussed. But the way that you progress from the first half of the hub world to the second half is by unlocking some fireworks, and they very lazily do like this. <laughs> There's no like awesome like explosion, at least on the PS3 version. It was just it crashed through a, this hole in the top of a ceiling or the roof, and then that was it. Another thing that's kind of reminiscent of Spyro. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, like not in a good way. Maybe that's and why Spyro I enjoyed the sword so much. Um, it was pretty wild it, when he used fireworks to destroy an entire village all at once. So <laughs> that was cool. I will grant to that. <laughs> So we find out that actually, I'm rewinding a lot, we find out that Panda King is actually um, a little more sadistic than the previous people, I guess, because but, he's offering, he's like essentially being the mafia in this area. He's saying, we're going to grant you protection, but if you don't pay for our protection, then I'm going to cause an avalanche with my fireworks. It's going to bury your village. And it's really I'm funny protecting you from myself. <laughs> yeah, pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Um, I love Bentley's response to it. Oh my god! <laughs> like drug out. Um, on the subject of, of Bentley, I love Bentley, and uh, if you didn't do all the uh, you know 
saves you might not have got this, but you know, he has a different response for every one of the saves whenever he finally cracks the code. But uh, one of them, he cracked it, and he said, well, Sly, I had to, uh, had to face some really big personal demons here for this one. But he's <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because they're usually like, I'm the man, Sly, here's your code. Mm-hmm. But this one <laughs> is completely uh, different. reminded me of Morty for some reason. Yeah, like it was probably my delivery was I, I stuttered a little bit more than Bentley because I had remember. <laughs> um, but moving on from this, there's so after we move to the second half of this world, um, our progression, you know, kind of go any direction we want as we've previously discussed. We've already talked about a lot of the levels, so I don't really think there's anything in particular that we need to talk about. But another thing that, again, just didn't stand out to me, it was kind of boring, was in these previous levels, every time you progress to the second half of the hub world, there was something interesting, something unique. And then when you progress to the boss fight, you'd also have to unlock that. There'd be some unique way to go to the boss world. In this, with Panda King fight, it's the exact same gimmick with the fireworks. The only thing that makes it a little bit more interesting is you unlock the fireworks and you can hook on with your cane and the fireworks carry you. That was a little cool, but the fact that we'd already seen the fireworks earlier and there's no spectacular explosion or colors or anything kind of detracted from the experience to me because part of my enjoyment of these worlds is getting to see how I'm going to progress to the next part. And for the fireworks, and I even blow up, it kind of defeats the purpose of fireworks. But yeah, I tried to hit them. Because <clears throat> at no other point in this did you have to use fireworks as a ride. Yeah. So I tried to hit them, and then it's like, Sly, you need to climb onto this. Yeah. It's like, okay. And then it goes really, really <laughs> slow. Yeah, that's exactly. fireworks. He, he likes... <laughs> I don't know. It's just kind of boring. And that's how I felt about a lot of this. I'm going to stop being a dead horse. Uh, we're going to move on to the boss fight. So, Flame Fu. Our enemy, yeah, Flame Fu is the name of this boss fight, and we're fighting against the Panda King. Um, it's crazy because despite everything else in this world, and it'd probably be my least favorite world in the game, I think this is my favorite boss fight. I don't know how everyone Hands else down. experienced it. Okay, great. So I have at least one other person. It's the first boss fight in this game. This feels like a boss fight. You get to fight someone. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's not gimmicky as much as it is, you know, you're actually fighting him. And it makes sense, because this guy's, you know, whole theme is, is kung fu and, and flames. And so he's hitting you with these cool, like, flaming kung fu attacks. Mm-hmm. Um, does anyone want to take it and really discuss what they thought about it? I thought this was the most fun and interactive boss fight, but I also thought it was probably the easiest boss fight in the entire game that we've been through. Because I don't know if I... I think I got hit once... But for the most part, you just like run up to him and hit him, and then he sends you back, and then you run up to him and hit him again. But it was still the most interactive, and it felt the most like a boss fight out of any of the other bosses that we've fought so far. Mm-hmm. I agree. His attacks were the easiest to avoid. Um, I think I only died once because I got stuck on a pot, and he hit me with a fireball. And that, was, mm-hmm. that was about it. This was, you, this was my third favorite boss. Um, so he was fine. Um, I did did like the pattern of deal a certain amount of damage, get launched back, and have to like trek. Kind of wish they would make it make it more interesting each time. Like maybe he does a different attack than just shooting a fireball at you. Like he does that all three times you have to, or four times you have to approach him. Um, but I thought it was a cool concept. And then you know his moves are easily chore like they're choreographed so you can dodge them easily um but they also introduce like new moves the more damage you deal to them um it was interesting i think my biggest problem was though it was just very repetitive because he was a little damage spongy um in like 3d platformers and stuff uh and pretty much pretty much any game i'm vastly prefer a boss where it's like do this specific interesting thing like three to five times than just beat on them for a long time and then dodge their attacks. Um, so he's a little damage spongy, but I mean, he wasn't a bad boss. I thought he was designed well. It just wasn't my kind of boss. Um, so that's why he sits kind of in the middle for me. John? So, I, I feel that. Um, with this boss, I think Joseph's the one who said it. He was 
probably the easiest boss in the game. Um, Kurt, you mentioned that his attacks are very well choreographed. They're easy to tell what he's going to do. And I think they could have left it at that, but for the sake of flavor, and I don't know how much of this is the fact that it's supposed to be a kid's game or what, but, you know, every time he's going to say something, he's like, Sumo Chop! And, or, he, you know, he says whatever attack he's going to do. It, yeah. It's fun and goofy and cool, but I think they should have left it to, like, the, the phase where he introduced the attack, he should say mm-hmm. it, and then stop. You know, I, I think it could have greatly improved that boss fight, because... I think it would have been easy regardless, but it was too easy because every time he was going to attack, I didn't have to watch him. I was just running around in circles, smacking him, mm-hmm. and then he'd go, you know, hands of fire or whatever his attack was. And, you know, I would have time to jump out jump. of the way way before it ever happened. So I think that they should have introduced a audio cue with an actual, you know, visual cue the very first time he uses the move, and then the next phase, they should have just had a visual cue. And I think that would have made the boss fight a little more difficult. Um, coming off of the Miss Ruby fight, you know, I don't know how easy this actually was. It was, it was of course, easy, but, you know, comparatively, I'm, I'm thinking about, like, how much frustration that fight brought me. Mm-hmm. This one, I beat it on my first try, so it was just, you know, oh, it was fun, and that was it. Um, which again probably influenced my ranking of the bosses as well. <laughs> if you fast forward the whole time, he never finishes the name of his attack. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Also, one of his attacks is called like Thunder Slam or something, and then when he does it, just a burst of fire comes out. So I don't know who's naming these attacks, but I don't <laughs> think I don't think they did a good job. He was, he was translating from from Chinese, so yeah, not all of it. Problem. Yeah, uh, lost in translation. Yeah. Um, So as far as this boss, I guess we've pretty much covered as much as we can. He's fairly straightforward, um, more traditional boss. You just go and whack him until he's dead. Uh, I enjoyed it. Joseph enjoyed it. I think none of us really have negative things to say about it. So no one else has anything else. We'll move on. Uh, After we beat Panda King we end up getting his chapter, the Thebius Raccoonus, um, which is interesting because rather than giving us a new ability, a new skill, it talks about a Cooper, one of Sly's ancestors, who was not really too physically capable. So instead of using his, you know, outstanding flippy flips or rolls or whatever, he created machines that helped him in this heist. Uh thought this was pretty cool because it's immediately introduced in the next chapter. Uh, and this chapter is called the Cold Heart of Hate. It. Oh, okay. Yes, it's Clock, called Clockwork Clock, 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 now. <laughs> <laughs> um, we find out at the beginning of this chapter that we're going to face Clockwork, who is an owl, who is some type of ancient being. We, we don't really know other than he's an owl and he might have existed Throughout multiple lifetimes, we're not sure. Can speculate though, like, is he a robot? Is he a cyborg? Was he always completely made of metal? What's what do we think is happening? He's Mister House from Fallout New Vegas. He's, he's a robot. Phoenix, I thought you were talking about just the Doctor. Comes back to life. No, and that might be how that series ends. Who knows? <laughs> so we Can't need confirm to have it's not. Uh, we need a backlog crew on New Vegas because I haven't played that one all the way through, so I can't. But you're going to say you. House? <laughs> no, yes, on House. Um, <laughs> watch all nine seasons. Of house. I will pass on that. Has a, has actually, a did, actually did that last year. It's a good ending. It's a good ending. Does he finally? Actually, actually is a pretty good ending. The, the show kind of goes downhill, but it's a pretty good ending. Does he pay? What, what, what are we talking about, Ryder? What we're talking about? It. This is our House backlog crew now, right? That's what we're talking about. Oh, yes, yes. He, I thought it got weird when Olivia Wilde's character kept coming back and then leaving and then coming back. What did you think, John? Anyway, so, so is a hazardous a... path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is a... Uh, I don't want to jump ahead to the boss yet. I do want to yeah. talk about... Kurt, you brought up, you know, was he always an owl or whatever. I, I do want to talk about that, but I want to hold off for just a little bit. I apologize. Um, no, you're good. So, talking about this chapter... This is 
a really interesting chapter to me because it deviates from our previous formula. Uh, we talked about earlier, we have a hub world in every one of these previous chapters where we're allowed to choose the order of the missions. If you want to do three mini games back to back to back and then do the platforming levels, do that. Doesn't matter. As long as, you know, you're not blocked by the wall that prevents you from progressing to the second half. The, the big change up in this is that this is extremely linear. Um, for all better or games. worse. It, all mini games. I'd say that I think the first like three or f- I think the first three areas are mini games, and then you get a platforming level, then a mini game. But I this was a complete breath of fresh air, and I don't know how you guys felt about it, and I'll of course give you time to to respond. But I don't know if this is my favorite world, but it's probably tied with the uh, vicious voodoo. Because it was just, it was such a, like I said, breath of fresh air getting to do these these mini games. They weren't mini games that were rehashed from the previous area. Some of them were similar, but they were all different enough that I, I was just, I was completely blown away with like the, the variety. Every single level felt different, and it really felt like they pulled out all the stops for the last world. And it made me feel like it was more action packed, like there was something to to be working towards. Because I wasn't able to leisurely take every mission at a time and go and find each little clue for the safe. I had to, you know, push and push and push to the end. Uh, I felt like I was actually on the clock work. Wow. (laughs) Well, well, that was our discussion of Sly Cooper. We'll see you next time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh no. All 14 subscribers. They're just gone. (laughs) Some of them are us. It's very strange. (laughs) So, one thing I wanted to add to what you said, this is the final area, like we mentioned, and I really thought that it did a great job of giving everyone their time to be the hero. It gave everyone mm-hmm. their time in the light to show, showcase their skills and really um, demonstrate just how valuable of an asset they are to the team. And uh, I thought that was a very good thing to do, especially <laughs> near the end of the game, just to show how important everyone mm-hmm. was in their own way. Including Carmelita. Yeah. Surprise, yes, including Carmelita. A really um, cool, cool moment. That was probably my favorite of the uh, other characters getting to shine um, mini games, even though it was the most similar to one we've already done. Mm-hmm. So, so, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, hit it, John. I was just going to say, I was going to start on the first one. The first one was A Hazardous Path. And I would like to point out, just right off the bat, that Half of the issues that the team has on a hazardous hazardous path could be solved if they just stop the vehicle for a moment. But <laughs> you know, you know that would have been too easy. So you're you're going through multiple different areas. You have a turret on the back of a van, or the van. So Bentley's driving you through these areas, and then you're you're Are encountering, you? yes, him too. And <laughs> The first, the first part, you're going to go through a minefield, and you have to shoot all the mines with your turret, and then you progress further. You fight some flying uh, mini owls that will try to dive bomb you, and then you move forward, and then you have rocks that come at you. And then these will just repeat and then mix together for this area. And overall, the part I had the most worst trouble with in this area was just the owls, just trying to get it on on the correct uh, lineup to get these owls. And I ended up having to swap to the uh, up, down, left, right controls instead of the uh, the stick. So that's what I ultimately had to swap to in order to get those owls to line up with the site there. Is he used the have... directional pad instead of the analog stick? Yes, Framing? those are the correct names for those. And that is exactly, <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not that trying is exactly to like, what I did. I'm not so. trying to be rude. I was just trying to clarify because I wanted to make sure. Because yeah. that's what I was doing as well. Um, I started with the stick, and I didn't, I didn't have a lot of trouble with it. But once I, I was just curious, I had a break where I wasn't being attacked, and I was like, I wonder. And I moved the uh, the directional pad, and I was like, Oh, that's and it nice. It was a lot it, easier. Yes, it it's. This game, you can tell it was made during that, like, transition era where, like, Analog 6 weren't extremely new. They've been around for six, seven-ish years now, but they're still new enough that games don't want to commit to, like, one or the other, you know? And, like, maybe the controls feel a little loose on the Analog 6 or vice versa. Um, And so it was really nice getting to use the... um, 
directional pad for that. Maybe I should have tried that because I died like five times on this. And I don't know if anybody else had the same thing, but I couldn't figure out or I figured out that you couldn't turn rumble off. Correct. And so I was just firing, firing constantly because you just hold on the button and it shoots and it rumbles like max rumble. <laughs> and so by like my fifth time, my hand, I like put down the controller and I literally was like, my hands are numb right now now because of this. <laughs> but I didn't use the D-pad because I didn't think about it. So maybe that would have been easier. I don't think I used it <laughs> once in the entire game. D-pad and, <laughs> and spam. Like I spam the entire, I don't think I stopped shooting the entire time. I'm glad there wasn't like an overheat mechanic, or ammo mechanic, because I definitely would have ran out. Mm-hmm. I never the only reason I cleared either. it. Same. Yeah. Got some lucky shots on there too. I don't think my PS2 had rumble, so I didn't have to run into that either. Uh, yeah, it was. You know, I don't. It was wild. It <laughs> and then at the end of the level, Mary's like, "All right, I'm gonna destroy this toy." That, that was hilarious. Though. <laughs> yeah. just, that felt more realistic than anything else. Or Sly is like, "Mary, don't Accurate. go through the cave. You're gonna destroy." It. Mary, don't do it. And then they come out of the cave and what? Sly is like, "Mary, we, this would have been a lot easier if you didn't destroy it." <laughs> Wasn't that like what we had just gotten from the Thievius Raccoonus in the last yes. one too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it lasted like one section. Yeah. <laughs> and so this uh this was everyone done with the hazardous path? I was gonna yeah, say yeah, yeah. forward. Okay, right, go ahead. So yeah, Me this too. leads us forward to uh, burning now. Burning Robert. Well, I just had these on <laughs> point. I, I had talking points ready for these. So this leads us to burning rubber. So after our gun is gone. Um, we're we're entering an area where we need to get through a door. However, that door is locked, and in order to unlock it, we have to run over electronics so we can hack into the door. And so, in order, you have to run over computers that are falling from the sky before the lava slugs eat them. And I laughed very hard at that, and that's that's why I wanted to. That's bring that up works. first. You Just run over, the fact yeah. that, yeah, that's run over not CO2 the only monitors. way hacking works. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, I'm just like a a meager ahead. music education graduate student. So I was going to ask you, computer science guys, like, is that is that above board? Mm-hmm. That's that's what we do. That's okay. exactly what I did every day of the of class. <laughs> we the... fought we fought off fire slugs to <laughs> our government. Our <laughs> 9 a.m. every God, day. I had so I many can't burns. Hang out tonight. I need to go wax the van for tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually, I really enjoyed this mini game. I thought it was really fun. I mean, it, in practice, like it doesn't make any sense. But you know, we're again playing a game as a raccoon who walks on two feet and steals from other thieves. So again, <laughs> can't fault it too much for that. But I had a lot of fun doing this. It took the driving mechanic from something that was kind of frustrating to me to something that was extremely enjoyable. Um, of course, I wasn't trying to race. You get to bump around the slugs, knock them over. Uh, it, it kind of combined the best of the previous twin stick shooter, uh, a two, two stick shooter uh, crab minigame we had in the very first world and the racing you know, mechanics and put them together and made them something Things that I didn't enjoy either on their own, but made them both really fun. What's great about that is the fact that Bentley comes on the uh, radio and he says, Sly, there are 119 computers that are going to fall. You need to hit 60 of them. Yeah. And I don't know why, yeah. but just him yelling the number 119, I was just like, <laughs> how do you know this? He's smart. But uh, uh, I, I ended up dying the first time I did it. I, they got 60, I got 59, and I was rather disappointed. <laughs> so I was just running around, like, bashing the slugs and was, you know, didn't have nearly enough computers. And at one point, I was waiting on, like, more slugs and realized there weren't any coming yet. And I was like, oh, yeah, i got to run over computers. So I didn't have to redo it because I was just <laughs> so, like, overzealous about, like, crushing slugs. Um, it's a shame I didn't have any salt. Uh, mm. If you want to move on to the next portion, go ahead. these are, <laughs> these are oh, no. fire slugs. They'll turn it to glass. Anyway, ah, that's it. Spider, that's that's how you tell a joke. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I think that. Are you, go ahead. Does anyone else have anything else to say about this section? 
I'm not trying to, to speed through this. They're just fairly you're, straight No, you're forward, good. I literally... So. I was literally still having camera troubles, thing. but other than that, it was fun. Throughout the entire game, I, I was really still moving the camera left and right and getting it backwards every time. Mm. So, John, how about you? Um, the, uh, if you will, move us to the next section is what I'm saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That was, that was <laughs> the worst perfect. way possible no, to transition. say that. Like, Please I, I talk more like about the slugs. I will continue doing this for most of these other ones, the ones that I remember. Okay, so next, as we finally hack into the hack into the door, and we get that open, we've conquered our slugs, and then we move forward to a daring rescue. And so, in a daring rescue, we enter an area that is clearly booby trapped everywhere. And then, as we can see in front of us, guess who is locked up in a cage? It is Carmelita herself. And so, exactly. And then we realize that no matter what we do, we cannot directly go forward to help save Carmelita. And so we have to find an alternate path. And so this alternate path takes us above the area and over the different traps and spotlights. And so we find our old friend, the barrel. And this barrel is going to, of course, be our best friend even more this time. So we can avoid these arrows to the face and some more arrows and then try to hide in it as we evade these different spotlights that are in the area, which we had just jumped on top of multiple one, multiple different lights. We couldn't have unplugged them or anything. That would have been too easy. So after <laughs> we get through that, <laughs> we can try to save Carmelita. So I'll let uh, someone else take it away from there. So this section, so I just complained a lot about the previous world with uh, Kung Fu Panda. And uh, I didn't like that because it, it was a rehash of these previous mechanics, previous levels that we've done, and and some ways worse, in some ways pretty much the same. This was an example of something. That, uh, this whole world actually was an example of reusing mechanics and making them better. Like like I said, the the previous level we had the uh, the racing mechanic plus you know the twin stick shooter, not that element, but you know trying to keep the crabs playing keep away with crabs for the computers. Uh, this, we had the barrel. I thoroughly enjoyed using the barrel here. I don't know if you guys felt the same way. Um, it wasn't nearly as tedious as the level in the first world where I having to run around in the barrel. Um, it was harder, I think, in this, just because the, the platforming stealth part of it, it just is slowly ramped up throughout the game. Um, but I actually enjoyed this because it took me, like, two minutes, and I didn't have to walk around in a barrel for, you know, forever trying to avoid guys here here and here um i thoroughly enjoyed this portion joe how did you feel about this i died a lot because i forgot about the arrow traps and the last time we saw them there was mm -hmm. like really obvious bright blue carpet that indicated where they would shoot you from and this time mm -hmm. it was just slightly darker floor that i didn't notice so every time that showed up i got hit by the arrows but <laughs> for the rest of it I, I i really enjoyed how it's just a smaller section which is kind of what I'm enjoying about this entire world so far, is that it's just small tastes of everything that we've done so far that builds up, like, continually. So overall, I really liked this section. I thought it was fun, and it was a lot more stealthy. Kind of like the, the one mission that I was talking about in the, the last world, where it just made you feel like, you know, Solid Snake or Mission Impossible characters or whatever. Mm -hmm. How about you, Kurt? I, I I liked what Joe was saying. Like it was like a bite size, like, um, like intricate puzzle kind of thing, and it was like well put together. And it took all like the good parts of Sly Cooper and just put it in one attractive package. Um, I also liked just the story motivation behind it, where Sly is like, you know, I'm I'm a thief, but I'm not. I'm a bad guy, but I'm not a bad guy. He is like, I gotta save her, you know. Um, and I, I don't know, I liked the barrel level from the beginning of the game, so I was happy to see that mechanic return. But but like Joe, I also was like, oh, that's carpet in this volcano. Mm -hmm. And so that's I, I definitely died the first time um, that happened. But yeah, I, I enjoyed this section. John, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I mistakenly got shot by that first arrow that's guarding the barrel. Because... That's that one. I thought it was just, you know, something blocking the way. And then it shot me and I was like, oh, so I got to go around. Okay. You know, that yeah. makes sense. I just didn't notice it. And then 
other than that, I didn't really have a problem with that that area. I thought it was overall a very fun uh, sneaking level there. Got our sneaking suit, a.k.a. the barrel, and it was wonderful. So that was great. So as John said, uh, after we get through sneaking in this area, we end up in a room where Carmelita Fox is currently locked. Um, Bentley, in all of his infinite turtle wisdom, tells us it's probably a trap slide. Don't do it. It's kind of a piece of trash anyway. Keep someone to lock you up. Don't do it. And Sly is a, like Kurt said, he's a good guy, ultimately at heart, and doesn't hurt when you have a crush on Carmelita. So he goes to save her, door shuts behind him, and we see a ominous face pop up on the TV screen and tell us that we're foolish and have fallen right into his trap. And we can only assume this is clockwork. The room fills up with gas, and boom, time for another mini game, which is better than anything else in the game, but also a little frustrating, but... You, you like man Tron, in. on 1.5? That was that was the best. I'm sorry, John. We we both had pop culture jokes to make, it's and fine. we just stepped on each other. You're fine. Go ahead. So I heard the Tron one. What did you say, John? I said Bentley the Hacker Man coming in to save the day. Yeah. He's coming in to <laughs> shut off that poison gas with his hacking skills. Exactly. So our good friend Bentley is going to save us by trying to hack into Clockwork's computer mainframe thingy. And despite Kurt's earlier jokes about computer science and stuff, you know, hitting TVs or computers with a car, this is actually accurate. Um, I've seen people hack computers before, and it looks just like this. Whenever you're going to hack into someone's computer, you minimize into like a smaller, you know, slightly pixelated, neon-colored version of yourself. Haven't you seen Mega Man? Or played Mega Man? Or Nier Automata? John, I think we need to do a Mega Man backlog crew because I don't think I don't think that happens ever in Mega Man. This is exactly Mega what Man. happens in Near Automata. Mega oh, Man like Battle Me- Network. Look it I up. I say yeah, Mega Man oh. .exe. Okay, my bad, my bad. <laughs> so you go, go ask our buddy Zach about this. Um, speaking speaking of Zach, by the way, so we talked in our playthrough uh, backlog crew of Metal Gear Solid that our dear friend Joseph here is Otacon. Well, playing through this game, there are some moments with our good friend Murray, the hippopotamus, that oh, made me think no. of that because no. of his laugh and personality. Oh. Um, and his goggles kind of look like Zach's glasses. There, there's just one moment where he, he did... He, okay, so Zach is, of course, doing like a voice, you know, joking around when he does it, but like, Murray's natural voice is kind of like this. And like, I've heard Zach do a similar voice. And I just felt, I felt like I was watching it, so... Zach, You're being you mean. This? I'm not being mean. I love Mary. You're the only one that oh. hates Mary. Okay. Well, if you love Facts. Mary, then I guess it's not mean. I I played the other game. I adamantly I how... hate Mary. Mary is wonderful. Um, but he might he anyway. might become wonderful, but at this moment in time, he's a fun driver. Good. I'm not gonna say good he driver. He's a good he's driver. A good driver. <laughs> no. I drove. He is a good driver. Well, you had to do that race like four times, so I don't know if you're allowed to. <laughs> Shut up. So, uh, back to this mission. There's Hacker a Man. mini game where we're playing as Hacker Man Bentley. It's another twin stick shooter. You're going into the computer mainframe and facing against a digital clockwork who's also trying to keep you from, I guess, preventing this gas from poisoning Sly. It's a really fun That's area for me. Security system. This computer security system. I had a lot of fun with this. Um, I died a lot. I'd say that this problem you see throughout a lot of the game is sometimes you have an adequate amount of uh, checkpoints. This is one of those levels where you didn't. Thankfully, it's short enough that even when you did have to restart, you weren't losing like five, ten minutes of progress. But if you get to the fourth level and you die, you know, boom, back to the beginning. And it did get frustrating for me after a little while. I enjoyed the twin stick shooter mechanics. Again, it felt like a steady progression until at this point. It was like, all right, we're going to throw it on you and sink or swim. Now, you know, you're six, seven hours into the game. Get good. Um, it was a lot harder, but I thoroughly enjoyed this mini game. Anyone else? Yeah, I got a good breakdown for it, but I'll let you two go first. <laughs> um, it's exactly go. how you hack anything in Near Automata, which is one of my favorite games. 
That's also the first part in the game that like gives you health aside from the lucky charms, which I thought was nice. Mm -hmm. the, the health was cool, and I was like, oh, this is, in my opinion, this is really hard, but, like, the health makes it reasonable, and it's slidey, but you get used to it, because I had to try it a bunch, because I died. My biggest problem is that the security system has, like, a red attack, and it just kills you instantly, no matter how much health you have. Um, and I found that really frustrating, because I didn't figure that out until... I got to the fourth level and I had like 13 out of the 15 um, cores destroyed that I needed to like successfully like beat the level. Um, and then I like got a little too close to the security system and it shot like a red thing. And before I had time to move, it just was like, you're dead now. Even though I had like four or five hits left. That was very frustrating. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of insta death in anything. Uh, I mean, overall it was, it was fine. It was definitely visually uh, like, stimulating it was very interesting to, to like look at and i thought it was a cool change of pace even though it didn't make a lot of sense i can make it make sense for you got you so <laughs> please do for this level bentley uses his back door into the program and so within the program he is actually decrypting each of the bits of data he's trying to get to shut off the poison so the yellow is the data we're trying to get and the green is the encryption so we are breaking through the encryptions to make it further into what we need from this to br turn off the poison gas. As we are breaking into the system and stealing the data, the computer's antivirus shows up to try to terminate our processes. And that is what the red shoots, uh, red gun uh, bullets are from the computer. They are going to be terminating our processes. However, if you can escape those and decrypt enough of the data to get the poison off, you can successfully turn off the poison gas. Thank you, Bentley, for your assistance in using your hacking skills here. Yeah, science. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you should write the back of like boxes for games. That's what that felt like. I would buy that game. I would buy this <laughs> game, I guess. You would play just uh, like a, a six, seven hour version of just this mini game. Probably. I'm telling you, that's, that's what Nero Automata is. So, there you go. moving on, I think we've lingered on this a little while. <laughs> Um, You're welcome. As much as I love this, uh, I do want to hit the, the rest of the game because we do have a little bit left. So after this portion, uh, we do free Carmelita, and we have a, another mini game, which again is a rehash of mini game we've seen twice. It's the Keep Away game with Murray, but we're playing it with Sly, Sly and Carmelita. So. Sly's cane gets snatched by a falcon eagle thing, and Carmelita shoots him down, and Sly's now going to have to go find his cane. Go ahead, John. I was just going to point out that they decided to have a truce after they after he saved her um, to, to get out of this area and actually take down the real person causing all the problems here, not, not Sly. They're trying yeah. to work together mm -hmm. temporarily. And uh, it ends up giving us this really nice moment. I, I personally loved it. I love Carmelita and Sly's relationship, period, but... This moment was really nice because Sly is like, wait, temporary? Like, you know, that's it after this? And she's like, well, I might give you a 10-second head start. Mm -hmm. and that, was, that was cute. It, it was cute because it's not, it's not just the professional thief versus cop thing anymore. You can tell, like, she is reciprocating some type of, you know, interest. And it's very, it's cartoony, but it's sweet, and I enjoyed it. And I, I don't necessarily need to have romance in a video game or like a story and it, but it is it until you know shoehorned because at no point mm -hmm. do they ever stop and confess love to each other or anything it's just you know banter between the two and i really enjoyed that it's like um, a crush yeah mm -hmm. it's reciprocated but you don't want to talk in about a good it. one <laughs> yeah so this section we have a uh previous minute game like i said it's playing keep away previously we were playing a sly shooting the bad guys away from uh, Murray. This time we're playing as Carmelita protecting Sly, um, which again, just from a narrative standpoint, is really cool because previously she would be shooting Sly, but now we're trying to prevent the bad guys from hitting him. Uh, I know in this section, I had a little bit more trouble here than I did with the Murray section. The slugs were fast for me. At least it seemed like they yeah. were. Uh, I feel like I had to shoot them a couple of times. I mm -hmm. might be wrong Okay, so right, that yeah. is that. 
so the previous area you could just shoot the enemies like once and that was the end of it but i, I had to shoot I the site like twice yeah, some yeah I, I, I think all of these you had to shoot twice i'm yeah, pretty sure you have some. to shoot them twice maybe i was just spamming so it didn't <laughs> matter but I, I just remember dying like twice because I remember hitting a slug and mm -hmm. then moving on it and then going. slide gets, you know, burnt to a crisp. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know how that happened. And then after like twice of that happening, I ended up paying closer attention to how many shots I was shooting. I'm pretty sure it was two per slug. It's where slug friends come back in. Um, I don't really have too much to say about this section. I enjoyed the narrative significance of it. Carmelita and Sly teaming up. As far as the gameplay, not too different. Um, Carmelita does tell Sly before he leaves that she has a jetpack that's stowed away at the top of Clockwork's death ray. And if Sly can get there, then he can have it. Um, and so once Sly gets his cane back, that is where he's heading. Uh, the next section just, is a... Sorry, go ahead. I just oh, go ahead. I wanted to comment that this is absolutely my favorite version of the like first-person shooter sections in this game. And I think it's entirely just due to the fact that watching Sly, like, use his agility and dexterity to, like, flip around mm -hmm. this environment and, like, be competent was just such a refreshing thing. Even though mechanically it was exactly the same as Murray, like, fumbling his way up a hill and getting scared every two seconds. Like, mechanically it was the same, but it was just really cool watching a, a character competent. You felt like you were actually back up like you were helping them and not, and not just like you were babysitting them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I could they were, they were I partnered. Could. Carmelita and Sly are equals at this point rather than yeah. big brother Sly. Yeah. Um, it was really and, cool. And, you know, there's a, the, coming from a narrative standpoint, I think that also, you know, it's interesting because we've seen Sly develop into this like master thief. Um, because you started the game and Sly is not a master thief. He's having to have everything explained for him, how to, you know, go around ledges and whatnot. And you get the interpretation that, oh, it's just tutorial. But really, this is Sly and the gang learning how to be thieves. Sly doesn't have his parents or the Thebius Raccoonus to show him. So he's having to learn along the way with his friends. And we've learned as a player at, at the same time. And so it's nice getting to see Carmelita watching as, you know, an outside perspective getting to see Sly for once outside of our own control, doing these cool flips and sneaking and whatnot. Um, I enjoyed that as well. This next area that we go into is another platforming section um, where we're playing the floor is lava, except for the floor really is lava and the couch is seeking into the lava. And you're essentially climbing a tower playing Race Against Time, a lot of uh, rail sliding, climbing, whatnot, uh, trying to get to the top of this tower before it's completely swallowed by lava. Uh, did anyone particularly enjoy this section or find it very frustrating? I found it very frustrating, personally. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm in the middle. It wasn't that bad, but uh, it's a meh. I was in the middle until I got to the part where you climb almost to the top and you literally just have to jump onto the top of the death ray and yes. like walk through the portal. And I got to the top and I was like, where do I go? Do I jump? Yes. And I, yes. Yeah. And I, I saw, and I saw, sort of go. I saw a thing and I was like, like below me. And I was like, Oh, am I like high enough to like go that far? So I jumped down and it turns out I just jumped to an area I'd already been. So I climb all the way back up and then I'm like, do I jump into this part of the building? And I jumped and I literally, they didn't like program architecture there. <laughs> I literally just like fell through the building and I was just like clipping. I'm like, what is happening? And so I died and then I climbed back up and I was like, do I jump on this part of the building? And they're like, yes. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the distinction yeah. was that was supposed to make me understand that. I did that specific thing four times where I got to the <laughs> very top and tried jumping on different places. And, and I didn't die initially on any of them. Problem was the, the camera would immediately freak out because the camera here is static and is, you know, it's a very cinematic view because it's following you as you swirl around this tower up to the very top. The problem is that if you drop and you don't die, like it's expecting you to, if you do hit this random, you know, platform, the camera is still going to be up here. It's just going to mm -hmm. freak out and try to like redirect an angle. And so I ended up 
stuck while it was slowly sinking and like trying to jump off to kill myself just because I didn't want to sit there and wait for the <laughs> slow uh, death. And even when I did eventually hit the lava, hoping it was going to bounce me back, it would bounce me to the previous platform where the camera like angle issues were. So that that's where like most of my frustration with this came from. Like I wasn't even like hitting the lava. I think there was one time where I died because I wasn't moving fast enough. But every time after that, it's just because I didn't. And maybe I'm just stupid, but I don't really think there's any real solid visual cues as to where you're supposed to jump at the very there end. There weren't. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a problem with this game in general, which is very strange because the very beginning they make it very clear, like, hey, these sparkly parts are things you can inter- interact with. Mm-hmm. But then as you go on, it's like, where do I go? And it's like, oh, I need to climb this tree branch that's the same color and shape as all these other tree branches that I can't climb. And it's like that kind of thing. Um, I think this part's like pretty clear about what to do up until that moment. It just happens that that moment's at the very end. So if you mess up, you have to do everything again. Mm -hmm. I think this area could really have been saved if there was like a checkpoint halfway through. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know. That might have broken the suspense of it or made it less rewarding for the player or whatnot but i i thought it was a little frustrating to have to just restart because there seemed to be a lack of direction at the end i agree it's something we've discussed before you know like you said checkpoints i I would have liked one i don't know where they would have really put it there's a part where you like run around the tower before you uh hop on like the spinning like point jump onto the spinning parts i think that would have been the place to put it because that's about it's about halfway, maybe a little sooner. Mm-hmm. Joseph, did you have any feelings about this? Other, I know you initially um, said that you were frustrated with it, but anything like more? I guess I happened to make the jump on the first try because I just kind of guessed the right place to jump. But there are plenty of times where, as I was going forward, the lava would be covering the next portion, and I just couldn't do anything about it. I, I mm-hmm. wasn't sure if I was just bad, but I thought I was playing. I thought I was playing fine. I was also playing with fast forward held the whole time, so maybe that was affecting the way the lava was rising or something. But mm-hmm. I ran into that maybe. a lot, where the lava it was. It speeds up everything. Yeah. So, so I mean, if you're not, it's funny because you don't really notice. I tried doing it like twice like that, and that's how I ended up dying was because I was raising the lava faster. Mm-hmm. Your your character does move faster, but my reactions weren't as fast, you yeah. know. So having like a half second of what it. It'd be like pausing for like a full second on like a platform before jumping mm-hmm. because I'm in fast forward, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that's enough time for it to lower even further into the lava. Mm-hmm. That was so my, I think that's really what the issue was. Yeah, that was my biggest frustration with it, was that the lava was in front of me sometimes. But other than that, I thought it was fine, I guess. So after we get done with this area, we, again, we're scaling to the very top of this death ray. We get to the top of the death ray and we can take Carmelita's jetpack. Uh, once we take this jetpack that actually moves us into the final boss fight against Clockwork. Um, I guess just general overview. What do you guys think about this boss? It was good. Yeah? Control you thought it was good? Bad Star Fox. <laughs> Controlled like Bad Star Fox? Is that mm-hmm. what you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so John, we're going for like one statement. It can't be any more than five words, apparently. <laughs> All right. It wasn't that bad. Okay, so I'll go for four words as well. It wasn't that good. (laughs) (laughs) I did not expect to be the person who seemed to apparently liked it the most. That's surprising. I'm not going to say I thoroughly disliked it, but I was thoroughly bored throughout. It wasn't bad as far as like the actual design or mechanics or anything like that, but this boss fight was so ridiculously easy. And I think especially even more than, part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially the the first part. I mean, I, I remember I having trouble with this time. as a kid, but I, I think that was just because I was my my hands weren't developed yet. <laughs> so like <laughs> the as simple as it is, just moving a centimeter on the screen could get you killed. But I didn't die once during this fight, and I don't think that's a testament to my skill as a gamer. I think it was just I think it was a pretty easy boss fight mm-hmm. overall. Um, well, not all of us are master gamers, and some of us died quite a I'm few a times. I'm a master thief, thank you. <laughs> so, I guess one part that did frustrate me, apparently it always happens to me where I'm always at the very end and I have to do it again. Um, but the part 
you had just mentioned for the last area, the jump at the very end is what did it for you. That was this final boss for me. So when you hit that third phase and you have to go through that area quickly without dying, and then you have to jump on top of the owl, and then his head comes up and you just got to hit it a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I jumped too far forward and landed on his head. And when his head came up, it put me in the lava. And it made me very angry. Wild. I did the same thing. Because like you had mentioned, there was no denotation of where you should go. And so I just went as far as I could. And that, yeah. was, that was incorrect. I'm I'm kind of at war with myself about this boss fight because it was cinematic. It was fun. It was easy. I died because I'm just bad at games, I guess. Um, in general, though, like as a principle, I don't enjoy boss fights that don't utilize mechanics that you've been learning through the whole game. So, like, um, this isn't a spoiler to say, but like Uncharted. Literally every time there's a final boss, it's except for the second one, it's terrible because it's just completely different mechanics than you've ever needed to use in the game so far. And it's like, what have you been training me to do this whole time if the final boss is just something completely different? Um, and so I guess you could say that the jetpack section with Clockwork is kind of like that. But if, I mean, you have had like shooter sections that have kind of prepared you, even though it's pretty different. Um, I really liked it. I thought it was very like cinematic and cool, which is, I don't know, I feel like that's worth saying, even though it's a kid's game. Um, but then that last section where you actually are doing the things that it taught you to do, I thought that was a cool uh, callback. And then I didn't really have much trouble with that last part. I just kept being bad and misjudging uh, where the rings were going to hit me in the second phase. And that's not where I kept losing. See that? I mean, for me, I didn't really have much of an issue. I'm sitting in front. I played it on PS now in front of a computer monitor, so I think I, maybe that's part of it. Is I had like a closer screen, you know, for like the directional, I don't know, movement. I, I didn't really have much of an issue with it at all. The first phase is way too easy, you know. I just blew through it, and then the second phase was just like this for yeah. me. And so I, yeah, I it, it is repetitive. It, it was just. Like I said, it was boring. It wasn't bad. It's just that for the final fight in the game, compared to like every other portion of this world, where it was just like, yeah, it's ramping up, ramping up, ramping up to this, you know, penultimate battle against, you know, potentially your ancestors' greatest enemy, ancestors like collectively, and then it was just, oh, it's this giant owl dude that I'm just gonna spam the button on, and and I enjoyed some of his dialogue, but like there's other parts where it was kind of funny where he was like. You are undoubtedly the weakest Koopa I've ever fought against. And I was like, well, I mean, apparently not. As he's losing <laughs> you know, like, against every, the, yeah. Yeah. Yes. every time you die, though, that's like his first line as soon as you respawn. <laughs> he's like, you were the worst Koopa that's ever lived. And I'm like, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. um, since I'm the only one who died on this, apparently, I'm going to use this as my platform to rant about the lucky charms that they give you whenever you die. So I died the first time. I didn't have any lucky charms. And then they gave me a gold one. Mm-hmm. And I just messed it up because I wasn't ready for the second two phases because I didn't get to those the first time. Um, and I died again. And literally, I, I probably fought them four or five more times. And they never gave me another lucky charm. And I just don't understand, like, even after I gamed over, like, I genuinely don't understand what the activation criteria it is for the game to be like you need a little help yeah. I, I i was very confused why it kept RNG. just dropping me in cold yeah yeah i, I never yeah, understood it might be random. this is a random chance that's mm-hmm. terrible yeah. i thought it was just after a certain amount of deaths like uh, consecutive deaths without like progression but i, I really don't know nah. i don't um, think so because I, I died a bunch and i gained over and died some more and i never got another one i think the, i had my most game overs and Probably the Miss Ruby fight, I guess, like consecutive. And yeah. I didn't really notice it then because I don't really think I got any uh, lucky charms. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but as far as this fight goes, you know, we kind of talk about the gameplay part of it. You know, using the jetpack, it's very different from the rest of the game, for better or worse. Like I said, I was a little bored with it, but we do get some narrative uh, tidbits here. This is something Kurt actually discussed before. So Sly, when he's looking through his semi-intact, uh, semi-repaired copy of the Thebius Raccoonus on the way to this area, 
he starts noticing in all these drawings, there's like an owl shape in the background in every single one of them. And he's like, oh, is this clockwork? Has he been here the whole time? And uh, in this boss fight, as we're fighting against clockwork, he ends up telling us essentially that he is the moral enemy of the Cooper clan and has been fighting against him, you know, since time immemorial. And, uh, you know, take from that what you will. I, I think my interpretation of it, so, so Sly asks him something along the lines of, you know, are you immortal or something like that? And he's like, oh, I'm peeled on hatred and <laughs> vinegar. He's, he's and basically that. Darth yeah. Maul at this point, yeah. right? Yeah. He, well, even further than Darth Maul. He's like, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do that, actually. We're, we're going to play KOTOR on one of these. KOTOR 1 and 2 is going to be your backlog crew. But, um, yeah, so he's kind of like a Sith Lord by the way he's describing it. Of course, it doesn't quite make sense because he's a mechanical owl. My interpretation is he is some type of, you know, uh, originally he was an owl. We know that, I guess, this is Assassin's Creed because the, the founding member of the clan, I think, was from Egypt. <laughs> so... Uh, if we go back that far, maybe he was an actual owl at that point, and then over time, maybe he has an extremely long lifespan or whatever, replaced a piece here or there, till eventually he's just, you know, a mind inside of this mechanical shell. That's kind of what the interpretation I went with. Um, it's the ship of Theseus. Is he actually yeah. clockwork? I mean, yes. <laughs> oh, okay, that it did it. You solved it. <laughs> it was like this has been around for like twenty five hundred years, and if only I was there in Greece when they asked the question. If, if only they had you, <laughs> I, w- I would have been a great philosopher. Um, <laughs> well, I like I said, this boss fight was very meh for me. I think we pretty much mm-hmm. talked about it in enough detail. Um, once we beat this boss, we have a complete-ish copy of the Thievius Raccoonus. Um, some maybe more complete than others, Correct. but that's fine. Seven um, pages. <laughs> we end up getting a nice cutscene where we've defeated Clockwork and Carmelita immediately confronts us, and Sly is a little scared because <laughs> he's, you know, never been this close face-to-face with Carmelita with nothing, you know, I guess to really run away with or run no direction to go because he's cornered. Uh, and Carmelita sticks to her word and gives him a countdown. And I, again, personally love this moment because she counts down from 10. And at first, Sly, in uh, the animation, is very scared. You can tell he's afraid that she's actually going to shoot him. And then about halfway through, he realizes she's not actually going to do it. And I love the way they animated or they drew his like frame where he's like leaning on the cane, like grinning at her, like, yeah. okay, yeah, you're going to do it. And then, uh, whenever the, her Carmelita's countdown hits zero, he goes in for a smooch and she's flushed. Cause you could, there's, there's been this banter, you know, they, they like each other, whether mm-hmm. she's willing to admit it or not. And, um, lo and behold, Sly has pulled a Elizabeth Swan, Jack Sparrow on him. And, Carmelita's now walked to the railing, and Sly escapes with the gang. And he's not upset because he knows he's going to see her again. Sequel set up, maybe. Um, I don't know if you guys sat through the cut, uh, not the cut scene, but the credits after this. Did everyone watch through? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we get a moment. I'm not sure if it's before the credits or at the end. I can't remember at this point. But we end up seeing that Clockwork's eye lights back up kind of indicating that maybe he's not gone. Uh, we're going to have to deal with him in the future, maybe. Who knows? Um, there's another post credit scene that I'm not sure if there's any qualifications, any qualifiers it's, that would prevent you from seeing it. Oh, John, yeah. um, it's an anime as heck. heck. Yeah, so there's an anime intro. I believe it was uh, the intro is, again. But is it the is, artwork yeah, it the different, or is it just in Japanese? It, it is different. Um, okay. I I thought it was different. I was watching it, and I was like, all right, so the eye shape and like face shape is very different. Like Carmelita looks very different. Yeah. But I, I thought about halfway through, I was like, am I imagining this? And right. then at the very end, there's like a part where Sly like runs, and it's very much like an anime, like zoomy zoom, and like Carmelita has her yeah, like... Out behind him. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of like that. <laughs> I mean, you know, more or less, it felt like that. But uh, 
there's a scene where like slides looking off in the distance and then there's like a like semi-transparent version of Carmelita like also looking off in the distance. I was like, <laughs> okay, no, this is different. <laughs> like, this is like very much uh, late 90s, early 2000s anime. Uh, and I, I loved that they threw that in there. There's no need for them to do it, but it was mm-hmm. great. And I went and looked on YouTube and there was actually a side-by-side comparison and I recommend everyone go and watch that because it's really fun getting to see oh, the differences. Um, there's actually a version for the ending of the game, and if you get to complete Devious Raccoonus. So, moving on a little bit further, I know this is going into uncharted territory for some of you guys, but if you... So, if you get every one of the chest safes going forward, um, you actually get a cutscene for the completed Devious Raccoonus. And it's essentially just Sly, like, putting the last little bit together and saying, like, I finally did it. And it's really nice because he says something along the lines of every other member of my family might have been a great thief, but I'm the only Cooper that's truly had to earn the Thievius Raccoonus, whereas the others have had it inherited. So that was a cool moment. Because yeah. um, it's not just, you know, there's, of course, the narrative part of it where, like, you know, Sly has earned it, he's went and worked for it, but you as the player, if you've, you know, put in the time to actually go back and get the bottles and unlock all the chests, uh, safes, rather, then you're also getting this cutscene saying, like, congratulations, you've earned the Thievius Raccoonus. Um, I discussed earlier at the end of the uh, Fire in the Sky, there's a mission there where there's a safe that you can't open until you beat an owl. That owl, of course, is going to be clockwork. Well, I came back after I beat the game and unlocked this last safe, and uh, this is the last page of the Thievius Raccoonus. It ends up giving you the you know cutscene that I previously discussed. Well, this ability is the reason why they've locked it like this behind the very end of the game is because this ability allows you to temporarily stun every enemy in the world. Um, you like, I guess, like through like a firecracker, you know, like bomb or whatever, and everyone stuns and they don't move. You can go do whatever you want, run around them, and you can use it as many times as you want. Hmm. So that'll be really nice hmm. for doing time trials which is, I'm assuming, why it was included, so that you're not going to get bombarded by, you know, the ghosts or whatever in some of these enemies, uh, in some of these worlds. Didn't want to take that detour, but I felt it was necessary in case <laughs> anyone else decides to do it, watching through mm-hmm. this. Um, now we're pretty much at the very, very end of our podcast, the very end of the game. I just have a few questions. I'm going to start doing this anytime I host. Uh, the rest of the guys, you, of course, feel free to do this if you want to ask these questions or similar questions. But this is what I'm going to do. Overall, what did you guys think of this game? Just a brief overview. You don't have to go in too deep because we've already went out, you know, super in depth for all this. So just overall, did you like it? Did you not like it? Um, and just give it a score one to ten. Ten being the best. One being no, not at all. Eight out of ten. Okay, and so, did you want me to elaborate or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't okay. have to be super in depth, but just you know, what your thoughts were. Okay, eight out of ten. Eight because of the uh, just the ability of making me feel like the levels are a lot longer than they actually are, and the fact that they uh, use all the space the level provides for them, and then they continue to throw at me different enemies and unique environments, and building upon the skills that I've already learned. And then giving me the option to um, make my skills even better by collecting the additional parts. And then the 2 out of 10, just because of sometimes missing my inputs um, when I'm definitely hitting them. And then, you know, just like you had said, sometimes the uh, reskins of the different areas could seem tedious whenever you've already completed a task like that. So, there you go. Thank you, John. How about Kurt? I can't hear you. I can't hear you at all. He's gone. Hi, Kurt. Still can't Hello? hear you, Kurt. We can let Joe go next, and then we can backtrack to Kurt. Yeah, yeah. Joe, how about you go? So, if it was 10 years ago, I would give it an 8 out of 10. But for now, I'm going to, like, for nowadays, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Because while I did really enjoy it, it gave me a lot of, like, Spyro 2 vibes, which is the one Spyro game that I played, and I really enjoyed Spyro 2 and 3D platformers. I do think it has aged 
a little bit, albeit it's still aged really well for a PS2 game. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, there he goes. All right, I, so I switched to a worse mic because my other one cut out for some reason. Yeah, um, I'm gonna say s seven out of ten. That is that is my high side, not because it, I liked it. I did like it. I think the characters are fascinating. I think the level, like thematically, levels thematically were really really interesting. Um, but I don't think it has aged particularly well. And then even at the time that it came out, I think that there were other better options if you're looking for mascot platformers. Um, but it was still a good time. I still enjoyed revisiting it. I would say if you're interested, definitely give it a shot. But I don't know that I would recommend this just, just to someone asking for a game to play. So for my rating, I'd probably also give it an 8 out of 10. Um this is me revisiting it from a perspective of nostalgia. I talked about last time how it's kind of scary, you know, coming back to a game that I haven't played in a long time, a game that was one of my favorites as a kid, and having to come to grips with this might not be good. And I feel confident to say this is one of those games that is actually good. Um, I would give it an 8 out of 10 now. I'd probably give it an 8 out of 10 at that time, maybe higher. Um I think this is a game that is very much the first game in a series. Uh, there's a lot of amazing ideas here. And there are other games, I would agree, that are better at the time. Um, but also a lot of those games had the chance to, you know, progress on previous games, previous installments, versus this is the first game in a series. Also, speaking from experience, I know that the second third game, just from the pure mechanical side, are better the story is better, um, characters, you know, voice acting, everything from this point just gets better. Um, I love this game. Like I said, 8 out of 10. Uh, I think John pretty much hit the nail on the head for the reasons, the pros and the cons, so I'm not really going to repeat that. Uh, I don't think I get it much more succinct than that. My next point is actually what Kurt was going to say, uh, what Kurt has already said, rather. Um, would you recommend it? And I'm going to give you a couple of options. So it's not just yes or no. So would you recommend it? Yes or no. But if you do recommend it, would you recommend it to anyone or just fans of, you know, platformers, uh, specifically 3D platformers? I'll hit it first. I would say I'd recommend it to, yes, I would recommend it. And I would also recommend it to anyone. I think this is a game that's straightforward and uh, simple enough that anyone can get into, but it does have enough depth that uh, even people who are more experienced with video games can find something they'll really dig and enjoy. Uh, like I said, all of you guys play this game for the first time, and even if you didn't particularly love it, I think you still had a good time. I think that's really, this is a good time game. It's not particularly deep, or you know, it's not something you're just going to sink hours and hours and hours of time into. Uh, we completed it in probably, I'd say, six to ten hours, depending on how much time you wanted to put into this game. But it's straightforward, fun. Again, I'd recommend it to anyone. Who wants to go next? I'm not going to make you on this. I'll go. Um, like I said, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I would be willing to recommend it to someone who is a big fan of, like, platformers or a big fan of, like, PlayStation games, because I think um, I, I play a lot of games strictly because they're, like, historically significant um, as far as, like, video games, as, as historically significant as video games can be, um, and this is definitely one of those. But just to, like, the general consumer, if they were like, hey, I want to play a game, and for some reason I was in the mindset of, oh, I'm going to recommend a 20-year-old platformer, like I said earlier, I would recommend you know, Mario Sunshine, which came out, like, close to this, and those are different, but I mean, they, they, they kind of crash the same itch, I'd, I'd say. Um, but yeah, the game's, the game's good. I didn't dislike it. I just don't know that I would ever go back to it or recommend someone else do it. Yeah, I have a very similar opinion to Kurt on this. If somebody came up to me and was like, hey, I want to play an old 3D platformer, I think I would probably, some other game would probably come to my mind first. But if somebody came up to me and was like, I've heard about the Sly Cooper game. Should I play the first one? I would say, yeah, absolutely. You'll have a fun time with it. It's a good game. 
but it's just not the first game that would come to my mind if somebody would recommend a 3D platformer or a game in general. But I would still recommend it if somebody was interested in playing it. Yeah, that, that was a better succinct way to put it, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I kind of agree with those. It's kind of a difficult question to ask, though, because, you know, this game's, you know, dated. And whenever somebody asks me about an older game they recommend, or I recommend, I'm obviously going to pick games that have the nostalgia factor for me. Since this is the first time I've played this, I honestly couldn't say that it would come up in my list. But that's just because I have a lot more other games that have the nostalgia factor for the time that they that this was released. But overall, this, this was a really fun game. Uh, I had no idea what this game was going to be about. And so just... I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it compared to, you know, my initial reaction hearing about the game. I was like, well, never heard of this, but I guess I'll give it a go. But, you know, I did, I did enjoy all the characters. So, like like Joe had said, if somebody were interested in possibly that kind of, kind of game, I, I could see it coming up as an option. But just without the nostalgia factor, you know, it's not going to be the first thing that comes to my mind when somebody asks me about a recommendation. So, overall, we got some pretty positive reviews here. Um, everyone would recommend the game, given the right scenario. <laughs> There's no one that would say, don't play the game, which I think is a good thing. Yeah. Um, throughout this series, I'm sure we're going to encounter some where some of us are going to say, don't play the game. So, for the <laughs> moment, I'm going to start with a... Uh, and you guys can shoot me down and not do it, but for my hosting, this is what we're going to do. This is now a... Press A to Talk, Backlog Crew certified game. So <laughs> if you're looking for something that maybe is out of the way, you know, something you haven't really heard of before, something you've never want, uh, tried, or maybe you're just not sure if you'd even like to play, this is a game that we as a group have now seemed to agree that it is fun. Maybe not the first choice, but it is uh, ultimately going to be worth playing. Uh, I think the group consensus would be that. Yeah. Um, I think that's about all for this episode. Mm -hmm. um, hey, let me, if I may, you ready for me to intro the next thing? Yeah, go ahead, Kurt. All right, so uh, thank you guys so much for joining us um, for this uh, backlog crew series on Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Uh, we're going to be jumping into a new game next, away from the stealth game genre entirely. Uh, and we're going to move into the world of first-person shooters with Pokemon Snap for the Nintendo 64. Um, probably the most successful way to play this, if you're interested in playing along uh, with us, is it's available on the Wii U eShop for, I believe, uh, $9.99. Uh, that's probably where I'm going to play it. Yeah, that's going to be our next episode. We're going to play through it all uh, and record just one episode about the whole game because it's, it's pretty short and not a lot of uh, new different mechanics are introduced throughout. But yeah, so... Um, Ryder, I don't want to steal your thunder with the outro if you want to take it back, but not. I'll just say thanks so much again for watching. Um, this has been Backlog Crew. Thanks, guys. Bye.